Well, good morning and welcome to the seventh uh, meeting of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee for 2018. May I ask everyone, particularly in the public gallery, to check that all electrical devices are on silent so they don't interfere with this morning's proceedings. Um, item one is a decision by the committee to take items three and four in private. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Now, we continue our inquiry into Scotland's economic performance, and this morning we have Nora Senior, the Chair of the Strategic Board for Enterprise and Skills, as our guest. So, good morning to you, and thank you for coming uh, in thank today. Um, I'd remind members to keep their questions succinct, and um, also that uh, if there's any issue that you feel you haven't been able to cover adequately, um, you can feel free to submit in writing to the committee following the session. Um, so the microphones will be operated by broadcasting, no need to press any buttons. And uh, I'll perhaps start with a, a general question, and that is perhaps if you could give us an update on the development of the strategic board. Okay. Um, well, the strategic board has met twice. The board was um, formally brought together on the 13th of December. Um, our first meeting uh, focused in on looking at the economic context um, that's prevalent in Scotland at the moment, so taking into consideration um, the uh, Scotland's economic strategy, growth commission, um, fiscal commission, national performance framework, looking at the performance gaps between Scotland and OECD countries. So really looking at the policy and political context in which um, the agencies are operating. We also had an overview uh, and insight into um, each of the agencies and what uh, their particular areas of intervention were. Um, was felt that that was something that we had to do. We have a board which um, comes from a diverse range of businesses and other sectors. Uh, so we thought it was necessary that we all had an understanding of um, Scotland's, or, or what Scotland, the framework and agenda that, that Scotland is operating to. The second uh, meeting was held in January. Um, that was a strategy day where uh, there was the opportunity to have more of a discussion around uh, topics for um, us to, as a board, to look at key areas of challenge and priority and areas that we would like to look at in greater detail. Um, there were a number of areas that we identified, um, everything from um, a skills alignment through to uh, future skills needs, um, reskilling, um, also looking at the work that is already happening in those areas and finding out what uh, other information we would need around the context of, um, of work happening in those areas, not just by the agencies but by um, other organisations and indeed by government. Um, there were a number of um, outputs that we had on that. It became quite um, a, a obvious that there was a difference in the planning timetables of the different agencies. So a piece of work has been done in the interim to look at aligning the planning uh, timetables of the agencies that has now been done um, and also um, the board adopted the in the actions or work streams that had been identified within the interim plan which the implementation group uh, had worked on and published last November um, so the board agreed to endorse uh, the, the work streams within that around collaborative working so that the agencies um, could keep the momentum up in terms of the work that they are already doing in closer um, working together across a number of areas. So those are really the, that's probably where we are at in terms of uh, where the board is at the moment. Thank you very much. And now a question from John Mason. Yes, I mean, you, you talked about various things in your initial answer. I was just wondering, uh, you know, going forward in the coming months, if you could just tell us kind of what the priorities are. I mean, you, you, you said endorsed the work stream, so maybe you could just expand a wee bit on that as to where the how the board's going forward okay. in the next few months. In terms of priorities, um, the the current interventions are around um, um, the f the five key pillars of, of skills, innovation, investment, internationalisation, and enterprise. I think the board is very keen to. Um, look at any strategic plan being centred upon the, the customer experience or the learner journey. Um, 
what tends to happen at the moment, and, and this is why there is always feedback, I think, and indeed some of your, the last panel members I know reflected on the fact that sometimes they have a disjointed experience as a business um, uh, or a learner uh, going through the system. So the board is really keen to look at how we can make this uh, a much more seamless process, much more joined up experience for um, a business to go through, particularly given the makeup of um, Scotland's workforce and um, business community, where we have a predominance of small, medium sized enterprises and indeed micro businesses. And those um, businesses um, are under great time constraints. They are um, uh, very focused on their um, own um, pro profitability and productivity, um, keeping, the, keeping the doors open, as it were. So they don't have the bandwidth to be able to look at different um, or go through different systems every time they need to or they want to develop. So that one of the priorities will be on making that customer or learner journey um, much more seamless for the user. Um, another priority is to engage with some of the work which is already being undertaken um, and not just looking at the alignment of the agencies, as, as I said, but also looking at alignment of government. Um, one of the areas that the board looked at was digital. We feel that that is one of the key priority areas that needs to be looked at in terms of both pre existing and uh, future skills needs. Um, if we, um, as some of, uh, or we looked at some of the, um, the the context around the whole digital discussion, the agencies are doing uh, some work, SDS, SFC, um, uh, around colleges and digital enablement. The government also has its digital skills uh, capacity, its digital um, challenge fund. So there is a confusion there about where, again, um, a business would go in order to get the kind of help and support that they might well need in order to develop to the next step. Um, one of the other um, uh, areas of focus will be on building up our base of evidence. Um, we feel that there is, a, to a large degree, there is we have a lot of data, an enormous amount of data. But most of the agencies use the data for um, preparing their own plans. There is not a central focus and not a sharing of data um, to use it in the sense that I might say you could use as an effective big data analytics um, type exercise. So we're looking at how we can build um, our analytic capability, not just as a comparator with the UK, but more broadly um, on a global playing field, because we feel that going forward, that's where uh, some of our um, uh, some of our needs are going to be. So customer journey, gathering evidence, and um, looking at the or honing in on the areas of focus that we want to develop as part of the strategic plan. Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, and Dean Locker. Um, Thank you, convener. Good morning. Uh, just looking at those um, strategic priorities and, and performance targets, the, the interim strategic plan published uh, looked at some of the performance targets and the performance gaps currently in the Scottish economy. Um, some gaps were identified in internationalisation, innovation and investment in terms of uh, what's needed to take Scotland to the top quartile of OECD countries. Can you um, talk us through what do you think will be done differently going forward to make that step change in economic performance to take us from where we are right now to, to the target, uh, the, the first quartile? And do you think that um, target is realistic? To, to Is that a, a viable target to reach the first quartile? That's a very interesting question. Uh, thank you. Um, and it's actually one that the board is obviously discussing probably um, at length at the moment. Um, there are challenges around um, OECD um, gaps um, and the countries that are, um, who are um, in that upper quartile who obviously have a different economic mix than Scotland. Um, if we look at Norway, Denmark, Ireland, who are all um, in that upper quartile, um, these are fast-growing economies that you know Norway um, has has um, focused their economic strategy around oil and gas and energy. Ireland has focused it around exports and um, attracting large companies that they can then um, hub 
in Ireland, um, where then they grow small clusters of other companies round about them. So their economic um, makeup is quite different because Scotland is more um, a, a low wage, um, but you know, medium to higher sa um, a skill um, economy. So the 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 um, the challenges around um, productivity, um, um, sustainability, etc., are going to be um, are, are going to be challenging, I think. And we have to remember that these top OECD countries, as they keep growing, because they're not going to stop, that actually Scotland um, is going to have to work even harder to get up into that to keep to keep. Um, pace. So the challenge is, could Scotland grow at least 1% faster than these other um, growing economies who are in the, the upper quartile of OECD countries? And my gut feel, or not my gut feel, I, I know and I'm sure um, Mr Roy would support this, that there is no other um, advanced economy at the moment that is growing at, um, at that rate, that it would overtake or at least get on a par with that. So I think that the challenge is, I think the aspiration is right, but I think that the reality of actually reaching or closing some of those productivity gaps, the gap is always going to stay or be challenging to close or indeed overtake. So I think there are challenges around that. Um, part of this is understanding what the gap analysis is around um, where we are in terms of um, a productivity or sustainability um, or um, a, or inclusive growth. And of course, Scotland is looking at inclusive growth um, as one of the criteria to make it the best society. So it's, um, but that's not necessarily one of the criteria which are included in top OECD countries. So, um, uh, so I think that there are, are I think the, the aim will be to look at the objectives of where we want to get to and create a, a goal which is achievable, which will drive um, productivity, which will drive a uh, closer alignment across um, the agencies um, and will have an effect on inclusive growth. But productivity and inclusive growth are slightly different. Uh, thanks very much. Can I just follow up uh, actually on those two points? Productivity was given uh, as one of the reasons by the SFC for the challenging uh, forecast over the next four years. We, we're seeing recently in the past eight quarters uh, productivity in Scotland uh, declining, whereas in the rest of the UK it started to, to increase over the last two quarters. C could you give us your view, what, what are the particular reasons in the Scottish economy that productivity is so challenging? And then in terms of inclusive growth, obviously that's one of the core uh, pillars of, of the economic strategy. We've heard from different witnesses that ec uh, inclusive growth can mean different things to different people. Is there a, a recognised definition of inclusive growth that is used by the board and the agencies? Um, taking your first point, productivity and the challenges round about that. Um, the, uh, again, um, productivity, there are, I think there are many reasons why, and I'm not an economist, so um, these are more my opinions rather than even those of the board, because we haven't got to uh, that part where we've been able to sit and, and um, a really drill down into what our, our final definitions of some of these are. But in terms of productivity and challenges, part of the... Um, uh, Scotland has one of the, um, the lowest investments by business in um, not not just in, in R&D, but in innovation and in training and skills. And I think, and the adoption of digital technology. Um, you, I, I th um, many of you may have heard me say before that, you know, 87% of our businesses in Scotland have a website and use email and think that they are digitally or technology enabled. However, um, if we look at the, um, the the percentage of business who adopt, um, you know, customer relationship management or supply chain management or resource pl resource planning, um, we have around, you know, between um, seven and nine percent of businesses who will ad ad adopt those types of programs and um, and embed digital into their businesses. Our competitor countries and um, uh, those Scandinavian countries that I've mentioned, you know, their minimum is 43%. So there is already a huge, um, a, a huge chasm, if you like. Um, 
in terms of a business approach to it. So, and I don't think that that's something that that um, the agencies are able to um, uh, will be able to 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 flick a switch and suddenly business. I think that there are certain areas where we need to focus in on in terms of skilling and reskilling. And also in terms of productivity, for those companies who have adopted um, um, who have adopted uh, technology automation, for instance, then actually in some instances that's resulted in job losses. Therefore, although some individual companies may become more productive, actually when you look at the average and the, the GDP per capita um, as one of those measurements, then it's still um, we are still behind the curve. So. Measurements will have to change in, in, in terms of how we look at uh, productivity. Um, it may be, maybe we move away from, a, um, from, from GDP or we look at GDP per capita and make a, a measurement of raising wages by X amount by X amount of time. Um, so we've, there is still some discussion to be had around about that. Um, similarly, with inclusive growth, Yes, inclusive growth means um, different things to different people. Um, you know, we haven't bottomed out as yet whether inclusive growth means is it the whole of Scotland um, on a par? Does it mean that some areas um, can have better quality jobs, high skilled jobs, while others um, suffer more? So there is a discussion to be had around the definition of inclusive growth, um, whether it's focused on, on gender, on geography, on generation. Um, so I, we haven't quite um, reached a, a final conclusion on that. And final question, if I may. Uh, the strategic board was set up to align and streamline uh, enterprise policy across Scotland. We then had the announcement of the Scottish National Investment Bank. It might be early days, but do you have a sense of how um, the, the both bodies will interact and work together? Um, Particularly around growing companies, I see that there will be um, a very close working together. Um, there are some areas that uh, we're looking at, say, around gender and, and uh, getting women back into business. Some of the government uh, programmes at the moment only start for or don't start early enough to allow women to uh, get back to the workplace. Um, social enterprises are kind of um, on the, the, the cusp at the moment. They don't fall into any one sort of criteria box for investment. So some social enterprises really struggle to get the investment that they need to grow. It would be really helpful if um, there was a mechanic or a mechanism whereby um, um, I have an instance of a, a company in Dundee where um, it's a social enterprise very focused on um, um, very early a year's um, childcare would like to expand but can't get the financial backing because it and, or mentoring or business uh, mentoring that, that they perhaps need in order to take their, their enterprise to the next stage. But because of what they provide, then it would make complete economic sense to me uh, to support that type of business um, who could provide a service for um, a, a, a lower cost for women who want to get back into work. Um, and that then ignites another part of the economy. So that's where I see that there is, particularly for growing companies, that there, there would be more overlap and feeding into one another. Thank you. Um, a few follow-ups. First of all, Gordon MacDonald, then Julian Martin. Thank you very much, convener. <coughs> um, we've talked about um, productivity and um, the difficulty of getting into that top quartile. Um, we heard evidence last week that seven countries have been in that top quartile for a long number of years. So just to put it in a bit of context, could you maybe say what quartile Scotland is in and, and other countries that are in the same quartile as Scotland? Well, Scotland um, is about 17th in the rankings. I mean, there are some areas where Scotland um, ranks uh, quite highly, um, uh, but we are um, we don't rank highly in digital. We don't rank highly in investing in our in our um, mid growth companies. Of course, part of the problem is there that we actually don't have a significant amount of mid-growth mid companies. So for some criteria, we're in second quartile, some in third quartile. Uh, quartile um, and in some we are actually operating in in the upper quartile um, so but on average we probably um, are, are more in the second or, or upper third quartile and that, that second 
quartile. I mean, is that the same quartile as countries like Austria, Finland, Italy, etc.? Um, well, I suppose it, it changes. Um, I'm trying to think who we would most align ourselves with. And when you say that some of those countries in the top quartile are, are the ones that have been there um, for ages, there are there are some newcomers in there as well. Mm -hmm. So like Singapore, like Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, you know, it does fluctuate and it does change based on... Um, so I don't... Uh, although we are probably more ranked... Well, I think we rank below Austria. Um, that, you know, our aspiration shouldn't be to, to look at those kind of countries that we're already on a par with. It's to look at what are the countries that are in the upper quartile, what lessons can we learn from them, and what what are the areas that we could look at as... I'm, as I'm just trying to identify, having heard the evidence last week uh, about a large number of companies that have been in that top quartile for a long number of years, uh, and we are in the second quartile for a whole range of, mm -hmm. of reasons, including productivity and GDP per capita, etc., um, I'm, I'm, there are obviously, these countries that are in the second quartile uh, have the same aspiration as Scotland to try and be in that top quartile. Mm -hmm. And you know, while we may rank slightly lower than Austria, um, you know, there are a whole range of countries that are larger than Scotland that are in the same quartile as Scotland. I'm just trying to put where Scotland is in context. I think I would have to refer to um, uh, our economists to give us more um, background information. As I say, I'm not an economist, but I'm very, more than happy to, um, uh, to to put that forward to you if you want some more specifics about um, comparators between each of those countries. That we, you know, we have um, some comparison comparison material, um, but the reality is that you know it goes back to. Is OECD the right measurement that we ought to be looking at? And is it the right framework for Scotland to operate in? Because Scotland's makeup and its workforce is very different, and the economic environment in which it, it competes is very different as well. So going back to your question, um, you know, is OECD the right measurement? Um, it is a measurement, but it is one of a series of measurements. Mm. Okay. Uh, Gillian Martin and then Colin Beattie. Thank you and, and good morning. Um, I would like to pick on some of the things you were saying in uh, response to Dean Locke, how you were talking about skills and upskilling, and you mentioned that in your your, your first answer as well. The, do you feel that there is enough links with FE and HE with businesses? I, I, I tend to get the feeling that people upskill and reskill when they reach a crisis in a situation where they've maybe lost, lost their job or they can't find work, when in fact there could be closer links between the two, almost like a kind of shared CPD between businesses. Is that something that you've been looking at? Because it is quite difficult for people to upskill when they're holding down a job. Uh, unless the business supports them in doing it. Um, and there, at the moment, there is not enough um, training budget given by businesses in general towards upskilling or reskilling. Um, it goes back to the adoption, probably, of, of digital technology. Um, there is a reshaping of the workplace uh, that is one of the things that we're looking at. And part of it is a generational um, a challenge as well. So um, older workforce... Um, businesses having a reluctance to employ uh, younger people because it adds to their salary line, uh, so therefore it is an add-on cost. Um, we need to perhaps look at um, different workplace policies um, that uh, might have a, um, an effect on um, older people reducing their, um, their working week while bringing in younger people, apprentices, etc. In that way, you don't lose the knowledge, um, but you also then bring people on, which means that you are training on the job. There are obviously different uh, opportunities which come along, and there was a very interesting piece of work done um, uh, for, at the World Economic Forum on um, reskilling and upskilling and what types of uh, skill sets could be changed and flexed to work in other areas. And I think that that whole um, um, in-job uh, training is very important, and I think colleges are, are, you know, ideally based to know what their local business communities, uh, what their needs are. Sometimes, um, what, where there is a bit of disconnect is um, 
businesses is, uh, in this country are quite poor about forward planning. Um, so there needs to be training around management and leadership skills on basic things like budgeting, like business planning. Um, very few businesses actually have a three or five year plan. They may have a one year operating plan to get them through, but they very rarely look forward. Therefore, what the agencies, when they research the, um, the, the skills needs of businesses, are looking at a point in time and then um, apply their their knowledge to colleges, colleges um, allocate places based on the knowledge that they have or the feedback that they have. But then when um, the, the uh, when those students graduate, then um, they may not, not have jobs because actually the job mm -hmm. um, landscape has moved on. So um, skill reskilling and, and skilling on the job is certainly one of the areas that we are looking at. Thank you. Colin Beattie. Thank you, Convener. Um, I'm just looking at uh, the broad sweep of these performance gaps, and I'm wondering to what extent there is crossover or interdependency between them, and how you manage that. In, sorry, In terms of, you know, if you look at the individual gaps, obviously, for example, um, we need another 85,000 people to participate in the labour market. Um, there's obviously a knock-on effect from that into other perceived gaps, for example, in skills, job quality, and so on. How do you manage that? Um, sorry, I'm still not quite sure what you mean, that we have, we've got pro a, a skills gap, but we've got a productivity well, gap. If you look at the individual performance gaps, obviously there's a discussion about each individual, but by succeeding and I picked an easy one here with uh, participation in 85,000 more people. Uh -huh. If you succeed in that, there's obviously a knock-on effect into other performance gaps, yeah. positive or negative. How do you manage that? Well, at the moment, we, uh, we're doing... or The analytic unit isn't quite information yet, but we're trying to scope out a series of areas that they may well look at. So... If you, uh, again, going back to the makeup of our, our, our sort of business community, we have a small number of large businesses who are um, very successful and probably drive most of the export um, uh, um, uh, or export activity in Scotland. We then have around 20,000 medium-sized businesses, which is quite a small number. Um, and I have asked for more information about how we decide what a mid-sized company actually is. When you look at small and um, even micro businesses, micro businesses are, um, it's estimated there are around 198,000 micro businesses in Scotland who are not paying VAT or PAYE. So, does that mean if you do an analysis on on that and you have a funnel of those companies um, that can be can be moved into small business territory or even mid-sized territory? Um, then paying VAT, paying tax revenue, um, then th that then has a knock-on effect onto um, investment or inclusive growth activities in other parts of the country. So the the aim would be to look at areas like that and see if we invested in, in micros, which at the moment is not under the agency's remit, that would more come under um, a business gateway remit, but what are the what are the areas that would then um, impact and co cause a ripple effect over uh, each of the other areas? So, completely agree. It's the same with exports. We need 5,000 more companies moving into exports in order to um, uh, to, to move um, uh, or to move up into OECD upper quartile. Would we? Um, there are initiatives which are round about that. But doing an analysis of um, do we know where we are viewed as being who wants our who wants our services who wants our products we're very good as far as I can see about doing economic comparators with the rest of the UK but we don't always do comparators about um, with other global economies therefore sometimes I think what what um, Scotland thinks we're really good at um, is not actually what other 
overseas economies think we're really good at. Um, and I think there is a bit of disconnect there. So I think we need to do another piece of work around, you know, what is it that Scotland has as its real asset base, and then be able to, to plan round about that in terms of that's where the investment ought to go. So, and we, we will also be looking at, in terms of um, the work streams, looking at um, what is high importance, what's of low importance, what can make an effect, what's making an effect on the economy and what can't make an effect on the economy. And if you map out your interventions in that way with the help of the analytic unit, we should be able to identify some of those areas of activity where um, we should just stop doing it or we should do much less of it. And we should look at those areas where um, is going to um, drive higher re um, results and impact the economy um, in, much, in a much greater way. The debate will be, um, I think, round about, and it, it's probably a bit of both, investing in high-skilled, high-paid jobs, which are probably driven by universities and R&D, um, or do you invest in those areas such as construction, retail, health, which are which employ large amounts of people? And if you made a 1% shift in those areas, then it may have a bigger effect than making a 10% shift in the, the smaller high value. So there's a debate there to be had, but that has to be done on evidence. And I think a lot of what we've looked at in the past has not been based on evidence. Can I infer from what you're saying is that we are lacking information and, I, and this seems to be a fairly common thread running through everyone we speak to. Well, I would say that we have lots and lots of information, lots of information. Um, I think what we've, we're not quite clever enough about is making that big data make sense and make it work for us. So I think that you know that will be one of the um, the key aims of the the analytic unit will be to scope out how we embrace all the data that is out there, but actually use it for making better sense of it. And uh, a final follow up from Jackie Bailey, and then on to a question from Jamie Halco Johnson. I'm, I'm not quite sure it's a follow up convener, but uh, um, certainly I'm curious as to whether the strategic board have had any discussion or debate about why they think the Scottish economy is underperforming that of the rest of the UK? Um, again, first, probably, so we've had that discussion, um, but again, we've not reached a consensus on it. So I guess these are my opinions rather than uh, anything that, that the strategic board would be saying, yes, we think it's definitely because of X, Y, and Z. But I cite the, the, um, the things that I've mentioned before, um, which are around um, lack of digital take-up, lack of investment in, in people and training, um, a, a lack of investment in, in management and leadership skills, which impacts on um, motivation, morale and ways of working. Um, I think that it, we don't adopt innovation. Innovation takes um, many forms. You can be innovative in the workplace um, with individuals making their own job more efficient. You can uh, develop bespoke programmes with teams of individuals within businesses, or the next phase is that you come up with a programme or some piece of technology that you would then commercialise. Scotland is very poor at that. Um, our, the number of startups um, is is behind most of those other advanced economies. Um, so I think that again, there is a there's something round about that. So I think there is a raft of areas. I don't think there is any one thing that we would turn to and say that it's not um, it's it's because of that. I think in the past also we've looked at sectors and we've um, had a focus on sectors. But again, having looked at some of the evidence over the past 10 years of where we invested and what economic impact those, in, those sectors have brought, it is very marginal. So I think that we've not been clever enough about evidencing, reviewing and being flexible enough to change the, um, where our, our focus is. And you can't do that unless you've got the information. So going back to um, you know, what, what Mr Beattie said, uh, I think mm -hmm. the evidence and the um, having data that you make sense of is, is absolutely critical. I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't have an operational business plan without um, evidencing what I was going to achieve. Okay. Um, let me ask you then, um, 
given the, the, the sectoral approach, I think perhaps six out of the seven sectors that we were targeting actually haven't grown at all. They've gone the other way. Um, what would you change, if anything, about the enterprise bodies and about the skills agencies that you know set the direction along with the government of of travel? Well, you know, first of all, you, agent, the agencies can only do what the government asks of them. So actually, I have to say that you know it starts off with you know having your economic strategy right at the top, mm -hmm. um, because enterprise and skills agencies are only one part of that whole economic driver. So I think there has to be a very clear and joined up articulation of what government wants the agencies to do in order to drive the the objectives and the 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 end goals of of their strategy. Um, so I think that's the first thing. I think there needs to be more joined up um, a, a, um, joined up gui guidance within uh, the, the briefs that are given to, um, to agencies. Um, so the agencies will, will respond um, to that. What could they... Uh, sorry, what was your second part of your it's, question? It's, what could they it's do It's essentially what, what would you change about them yeah, um, to make them better? I'm not at the answer of that yet. I think that there are a number of ways to explore. For me, um, the starting point has to be what's going to um, ignite the consumer, the, the customer. What's going to make them feel as though they've got a really good experience rather than... And what what are the themes that go across all those five pillars of skills, investment, uh, internationalisation that makes that experience much easier for a business or a, a learner coming into it so that they don't have to... They feel as though it's not, you know... Um, no, uh, it's not a disjointed experience that it is seamless and that's when you get um, when a, a business has a good experience it's grow, going to grow quicker it's going to go faster and more importantly its peer group is going to look at it and go hmm that's interesting what they've done with their business I'll do a bit of that as well or you start that whole mentoring thing where people learn business learns from one another and we have to drive that much quicker much faster so i think more ali the alignment um, between the agencies is going to be critical and one final just point um convener would you include business gateway in that because that's if you're really going to be seamless yeah. one would have thought that's a really interesting point um and goes back to what I was saying about um, micros. So again, can't answer that, but it is on the, the list for discussion to maybe come back and make a recommendation. But certainly there is a discussion to be had around how do you help those startup businesses? How do you get them into the funnel? Um, and how do, you, uh, how do you help micros move up or scale up? Okay, thank you, convener. Thank you. Jamie Halker Johnson. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, some of um, what I was going to cover has actually been covered by, by Jackie Bailey there. So, but just to kind of just to kind of clarify, the, on the if government is driving the strategy, uh, driving the objectives and setting the strategy, how much influence will you have as a board in terms of directing day-to-day -day policy within the agencies? Well, I don't think day to day we would have. Um, um, uh, I think we would influence, or I think it would more around. So if I were doing something around, say, gender and trying to get more women into work, um, or geography with rural economies and how do you get businesses to function within a rural environment, um, then for me, digital connectivity is something that um, a, would be of paramount importance. So. My feed-in might be then, you know, we need to ensure that enable for this, if we're going to make a, a recommendation that you invest more in, in digital skills or flexible working for rural economies, then that can only work if they've got the infrastructure to enable that to happen. So we would feed into that. Similarly, on maybe transport and connectivity, how do you get people from one place to the other? Then we might make a recommendation around geography that if some budget was put into rural infrastructure, um, then it, 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 would, it would enable the part of the enterprise and skills system, support system to work more efficiently. And how practically could, could that happen? How, how, how practically could that information be um, uh, given or that direction given to the, to, to the agencies? Well, I'm thinking feeding into... Oh, you mean I was thinking feeding into government policy, not agency right. policy. 
But so, I'm, but what what interaction could you have, say, with the agencies to direct? Um, um, as I say, I'm not obviously not day to day policy, perhaps, but uh, but where where you see a priority for Scotland and the Scottish economy as a whole, or you see a, an area around productivity or skills gap, how could you feed that information into the agencies to make sure that they were aligning more with 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 how you felt that the, yeah. uh, the well, needs of the government would be met? I mean, I align the the strategic plan rather like I would do um, my own business planning. Um, you know, we start off with a big strategic plan, a vision of where we want to get to, and then we work back to an operational plan of that's how we're going to, that's what we're going to do now, and that's how we're going to get to that end goal of, of what the strategic plan has. I don't see this as being any different. Um, the operating plans, the strategic board doesn't have any um, input to, but we can review it and we can measure it. The chairs sit on the board, I would see them as being uh, the lead um, into their own boards and their own agencies to ensure that whatever elements in the strategic plan were identified, that they were then um, integrating into the, the development of their own operating plans. The strategic board's role would be then to set um, measurements and performance framework uh, reviews so that we could um, we could analyse what had been done or what had been achieved. And in terms of measurement, um, Audit Scotland at present audits um, all the agencies individually, so there is no collective or there is no overview of the collective impact that those agencies make. Mm -hmm. So that, again, would be a recommendation that we would probably be coming forward from with the analytic unit looking at a, um, consistent and core measurements that would go across um, all areas of the agencies. Okay. Can I just ask a very uh, quick question as well in terms of you talked about future skills um, alignment and reskilling. Mm -hmm. um, would you should, would you think that perhaps we uh, as a country need to focus a little bit more um, or at least give more attention to kind of post-24 um, skilling? You've talked about job uh, in-work uh, retraining and training. Do you think that's an area that we could see um, more focus given? I think it's an area to look at. Um, I wouldn't commit to anything at the moment until um, I've uh, had a look at any of the data or analysis about uh, gap analysis on what makes a significant difference. You know, what the strategic board doesn't want to do is just run after the next shiny new thing. You know, we do have, um, you know, a, a, a very diverse, a very broad um, a set of agencies public, private organisations with lots of great ideas, all doing good things. We need to just work out, uh, and if Scotland can't do this, then I don't know which country can, because we are a nation which you know is small enough to be able to have those, get people round the table and discuss this. But we need to be able to work out who are the best people, where, where are we going to make the most difference? Um, and where are we, uh, and who is best to do to help make that difference? So I think that we will have to have a, a, to create a series of informed choices with priorities because we only have a finite budget, and you know we need to make some clear um, clear recommendations in the strategic plan around where we ought to be focusing that will make that will make a shift. And I don't think you can do that unless you've got some data behind right. that, because otherwise you're just saying this is a great idea, which it is, mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily the one that's going to make a significant difference. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you, <coughs> uh, convener. Um, in your opening remarks, you um, mentioned that the Strategic Board in its first meeting has reviewed the existing landscape, that, and you mentioned the economic strategy. Uh, you also mentioned the Growth Commission. What is that? Uh, well, I understand that there is a, a growth commission which is looking at different aspects of the economy, but its um, its, its um, findings are not yet published. Okay, so that's the SNP's growth commission. Uh -huh. you, oh, you haven't seen it or anything? You're no. just aware? Okay. <clears throat> um, the budget this year um, shows that we'll be, or the Scottish Government will be investing about £2.4 billion pounds in enterprise and skills. Um, it's also been indicated the Strategic Board will have some influence in the budget process um, and the budget allocations for each of the agencies under which you are um, providing strategic coordination. How, how do you see that working? Is that a relationship that you'll sit down with the Finance Secretary, 
um, or will it be subject to some formal protocols between the strategic board and government? No. Um, the strategic board will not make any of the budget decisions. That's out with our remit. No, no I know it won't make any decisions, but there's been a suggestion that it will have some influence in the budget allocations for each of the agencies. Is, well, is that your understanding or, or not? Um, I would imagine that as part of the strategic planning process, um, we would be giving recommendations as to where you know we think are the areas of high priority and most importance. But that decision around budgets would then be given over to ministers to, to uh, decide. It wouldn't be for the strategic board to decide. So it's more... Yes, no, I understand the strategic board won't be deciding anything. Ministers decide. So it's more that the, the finance secretary will be better informed, if you like, yes. of um, potential budget allocations in light of the work the strategic but board is doing. I think they would be aware of the, the areas of priority where we think investment in enterprise and, and business support in that in, in investment in that system, um, where we've made recommendations about where the um, where the priorities are, it would be up to ministers to be able to decide how they wanted to allocate that provision. Okay, no, that's very um, helpful. Um, I want to move on to sort of wider economic policy as well. Obviously, the strategic board uh, focuses on the enterprise and skills agencies and what they do, um, but clearly there's going to be some linkage between that and wider economic. So I'm wondering if the strategic board will take an interest in things like the National Investment Bank and how it might contribute to Scotland's economic performance, or indeed aspects of fiscal policy like the Small Business Bonus Scheme. I note that's costing £226 million this year, uh, but the total of regional selective assistance is only 16. That's a scheme, the Small Business Bonus Scheme, that's cost £1.3 billion, but there's been no economic assessment whatsoever. Mm -hmm of the economic impact of that. So there's lots of other aspects of both Scottish and UK government policy Indeed. obviously impact on Scotland's economic performance. Do you see your role as very much restricted to providing strategic coordination for um, the enterprise and skills bodies, or do you see a role in providing some leadership and some guidance and some views on wider economic matters? Well, I would hope that the Strategic Board might feed into and um, perhaps act as a catalyst for engagement with some of these other bodies. And I think you make a very good point about um, other frameworks and agendas um, which are embedded in different parts. Um, I think that this, um, the Strategic Board has to have an understanding of um, what those policies are and the frameworks that are round about there. And there may well be that there has to be one of the recommendations we might make is around closer engagement between um, the Fiscal Commission or um, the, the, the National Investment Bank, or there should at least be joined up thinking on it because one will impact on the other. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. And now on to Gordon MacDonald. Thank you very much, Convener. Uh, some of the questions I was going to ask have already been covered, but um, just as a, a, a general question to start with, how do you think the Scottish uh, economy has performed over the last 10 years, and what areas do you think have uh, shown uh, improvement over that period? Um, what do I think has performed well? Well, I think, you, you know, we've um, inward investment has performed well. Um, and we've, we've attracted a, a good amount of, um, uh, of, of um, external businesses to, to come and locate here. I think the, the research of the universities has been um, done, done well. There's been some expansion of high-growth companies. Um, what haven't we done well, again, going back to um, business adoption of technology, I think has been very poor. I think our rate of startups has been poor. Um, we've not um, got into exports as we probably should, and we haven't invested in people. Right. T taking that question of exports, I mean, we have seen an improvement in, in exports over the 10 year period. Mm -hmm. And um, the recent report that Spice prov provided us with suggested that Scotland has the third fastest growth rate for exporting businesses um, just behind Wales and East Midlands but ahead of the other nine regions of the UK. Um, you said earlier that Scotland needed to get another 5,000 companies to uh, become exporters. Now looking at the analysis of businesses in Scotland, two-thirds of no employees 
and um, 98% have less than 50 employees, and the vast majority of exports, 83%, are from medium and large companies. So given that the base we've got of medium and large companies is just over 6,000, how do we get another 5,000 companies to export when we've only got a base of 6,000 to work on? <coughs> it depends what sector they're in. Um, I, I agree with you um, in, in uh, your, your analysis there. Exports have grown in Scotland, but mainly because the larger companies have gone into more territories. So it, we still are depending on a small number of large companies to drive our export activity. Services is um, um, much greater in terms of exporting potential probably than tradable goods. Therefore, um, we have to look at what kind of tradable services we have. Um, tradable services doesn't necessarily have to employ um, large amounts of people. It can be accountancy or creative services. So there are enablers, I think, that um, um, we should look at in terms of um, technology to be able to uh, widen out that scope and perhaps get some of those micros, as I mentioned earlier, into you know the tax and the tax-paying environment, which feeds into the wider community. So I think that there's you know the, the, although it says five thousand, the definition of, of um, those companies um, and what they what they are exporting will will be different. Um, but again, we don't have really the data round about what the real asset base of what the tradable goods in Scotland are that actually our overseas um, uh, colleagues, if you like, in different countries want. And I think that we need to have a better or more clear idea of what that is. Um, and Scotland has traditionally been um, a supply chain. Um, you know, we, I don't think that we should overlook how important we are um, in our place in the supply chain, not necessarily being great, the, the, the people that do life sciences, but where do we fit in that whole supply chain thing? And one of the things I know from Chambers of Commerce is that those, um, the, the size of companies that you've mentioned, the micros to the mid-sized companies, what holds them back is a, the time resource. Uh, large companies always have export managers, so they're the ones that will uh, will do trade agreements, they'll do government agreements. Smaller companies don't have that facility. Um, but that is an area that perhaps some private sector can take over, and I know that there are initiatives going on with Chambers of Commerce at the moment to do uh, or to facilitate business-to-business -business relationship growth. That's really important because that size of company wants to, you know, the way that they do business is they find somebody that's already there and say, how did you get into that country? They learn from experience and they learn by um, personal introductions. So it's facilitating and make, making that route much easier and a much more uh, comfortable environment. So the exporting side, you know, is one side that I really would like to drive because I think it just opens up, um, um, it opens up new opportunities for Scotland. And in, in terms of that um, introductions that you were talking about, how, you know, because they don't have the export managers, etc., how uh -huh. important is a global Scott network to? They're to all that? important. Chambers of Commerce with you know who, with places in 120 countries, um, global Scott, you know, um, global Scott. Uh, um, a, they've got the um, the enthusiasm uh, to to want to do something, to engage with other businesses. Um, all of these facilities are are important. Mm -hmm. And and just my last point, you you talked about the scope for increasing exports is probably lies more in services and tradable mm -hmm. services. Is there any any tradable services that are unique to Scotland, or is it is it? just part of, you know, like financial services, which is part of the wider UK financial services? I mean, uh, financial services, but we also have a lot of creative industries which are um, which are mushrooming. I think that we've got a lot of, um, you know, a lot of the oil and gas companies are diversifying into the knowledge space. Yeah. Um, so I think there are opportunities there to take existing um, bases of, of, you know, industry and, and look at how they're developing or facilitating. Um, and also there are, you know, our large businesses like Amazon, like Google, um, who, you know, can help and facilitate um, getting small businesses into 
uh, traded environments, either through, you know, which are service orientated or um, tradable orientated. So I think that there are mechanisms that we've not quite joined up yet. Right, okay. Thanks very much. Uh, Julian Martin. Um, we've heard from quite a few people over you know, the time I've been sitting here anyway, um, that some businesses are saying, some people are saying that the, the support is patchy across Scotland. And I guess now that Business Gateway is down at local authority level, it's not going to have a consistency of approach. And, and there are reasons why that's a good thing. But we're also finding there's an inconsistent approach. We're also hearing from people like Women's Enterprise Scotland that uh, at Highlands and Islands Enterprise, Scottish Enterprise level, that the in terms of account managed companies, there's uh, not that many women led uh, companies as well. You've touched on both of those things slightly. Do you see the strategic board and having a role in assessing where that's happening? Because obviously. Uh, Business Gateway is often the initial contact for business support. So if it's not happening at that level, then they've potentially got a problem there. Uh, I think you make a very good point. I haven't got the answer to that yet, mm -hmm. but it is an area that, that we're looking into, is the, the whole customer journey and how it becomes... Um, you know who it's who it's appropriate for for business gateway, who it's appropriate for for the agencies, and how do you join up from point of entry, going through that full system of you know getting the help and support that you need at the time that you need it, whether it's startup, whether it's um, uh, skills or investment or help into exports. Um, so. Gender is one area, um, geography is another area, generation, as I mentioned, is, a, is another area that, that we would also look at as well as global. So to answer your question, yes, but I haven't got the answer yeah. to that yet. Um, it is early days. early days. It is early days. Um, and another thing, coming back maybe to linking in with my previous question around, around skills, uh, something as a, as a former uh, further education lecturer I found is, and you mentioned creative industries there, we have got rafts of graduates coming out with the skills to get mm. into the creative industries and the creative industry is traditionally one where you are self-employed, but not many of them having the skills to set up a business, even in terms of doing like tax returns and, and uh, incorporation and whatever. Um, I see that as a potential gap in, in skills. Is that something that has come up in your early discussions in the strategic board? Yes, a very good point. Um, I work a lot in China um, personally, um, and I'm very interested in the fact that in Chinese universities, they will invariably supplement whatever the core subject is for the student uh, with um, a business management uh, module or an international module, so that the individual, when they set up their own, they are very geared towards setting up individuals in business, a lot of social enterprise as well. Um, but it's having that um, knowledge about how to not just have your core skill, but then how to manage and grow a business. I think you make a good point about digital. Um, digital at the moment, we we can't get graduates fast enough. And I think that our whole approach to probably how we, um, how we provide digital uh, knowledge within our skill system is something that the strategic board will look at and who how how that's uh, developed one of the one of the the key areas is um i was at um a, a university in in scotland recently and went to visit some of the businesses round about and they hadn't they had employed a very small proportion of those who had come out with uh, technology degrees or computing degrees and the reason was that the technology that they were using in that particular business or those businesses had moved on from what was being taught. So I think we need to look at a more flexible system of how we um, integrate uh, learning with business uh, workplace based um, uh, placements so that there is the, I think that will help business embrace more technology in their, uh, the way that they, they run their businesses and I think it will also help um, the, uh, the skills uh, knowledge if you like about not just um, you know what you can do on a computer, but also those soft skills about how you work in the workplace, mm -hmm. uh, which is often what business complain about that they don't have the, the right skills for the uh, for the workplace. And are you having an overview of the agencies that already exist 
that are supposed to be facilitating enterprise amongst like young people, graduates. I mean, there are some, um, and and having a look at how they integrate into the chalk face, as I suppose it used to be called. Um, I haven't got to that bit. Yeah. In the <laughs> yeah. Um, but it will be, you know, that will be one of the areas that we will look at in terms of, you know, who's doing what. Mm -hmm. There is no point in reinventing the wheel. Um, we want to eradicate uh, duplication and we want to align um, both public and private sector and other organisations in who's best suited to do this. So let's not fall over each other yeah. and let's look at what, whatever else we, we should be investing in as a priority. Thank you. Um, are there any other brief questions from any committee members? Um, Andy Whiteman and Dean Locker, very briefly, please. Yeah, just a very brief one. I mean, the, the strategic board, I think there was suggestion at some time that it might be given a statutory underpinning. It doesn't doesn't have that. Obviously, do you have any sense about how long it's designed to to last and when, when your job might be done? Um, I can't... <laughs> um, I can't answer that. But you know, it um, it will be one of the things that we're uh, that we're looking at. My term is two years. The, the strategic board may still be in the same form. We may make a recommendation that it ought to um, look like something else. Um, you know, to your to your earlier question about the other frameworks and agendas. You know, we need to look at um, this. I suppose this is a point in time. So there will be flexibility and mobility in terms of the shape of the strategic plan and therefore the, um, the shape of the board and the performance measures that will be put round about that. Okay, thanks. Dean Lockhart. Yeah, th thank you. you. You mentioned briefly earlier that um, the enterprise agencies can only implement the guidance they're given in terms of central government uh, economic policy. Do you think the 4IE economic policy gives enough guidance, sufficient detail uh, in terms of what's expected of the enterprise agencies? Good question. Um, do I think it gives enough guidance? Um, within the framework of the individual um, portfolio, it gives good guidance, but there is, it's not joined up all across um, each of the um, each of the ministerial departments, I don't think, so that I think it confuses the agencies as to what their um, and there are different outcomes and measurements. We need to have consistency of measurement. Good, thank you. All right, well, thank you very much for coming in today. And before I suspend the session, just to say that um, I have another committee commitment and therefore the deputy convener will take the chair when we resume. So I'll suspend the session now. Thank you.
Well, welcome back to the um, committee looking at Scotland's economic performance. Um, I'm currently in the chair just to explain because the convener will have to go away to another committee uh, at some point during this uh, session. So I'd very much like to welcome the witnesses this morning. We have Linda Hanna, Managing Director of the Strategy and Sectors at Scottish Enterprise. Uh, David Oxley, Director of Business and Sector Development at Highlands and Islands Enterprise. Sarah Dias, uh, Head of Inclusive Models at Scottish Enterprise. Gordon McGuinness, Director of Industry and Enterprise Networks at Skills Development Scotland. And Dr Stuart Fancy, Director of Research and Innovation at the Scottish Funding Council. Uh, now, we, clearly we have five on the panel, we have ten on the committee, so there's potential for um, this running on, and we'll try and keep it reasonably tight. So if both questions and answers uh, can be reasonably succinct, uh, that will help. Um, witnesses, you, you do not need to feel you all five of you have to answer every single question if you don't want to, but I'll try and give you every opportunity if you do want to. Uh, I think a number of you have been here before, but the microphones you don't need to worry about, that will be dealt with by others. So uh, to move on to the questions, I'll uh, start off with a fairly kind of general question uh, to get us going. But I mean, we've asked this question, I think, of um, most witnesses we've had here over the sessions we've been doing. But I mean, what is the feeling? How do you feel the Scottish economy has done over the last 10 years? Any thoughts on that? And if you just catch my eye, if you want to speak, or I might just choose someone. Mr. Oxley, yes. Thank you, Convener. Um, I think, talk, speaking for the Highlands and Islands Enterprise, I think the last 10 years have been uh, characterised by a period of resilience. Um, we have obviously had a, a recession during that time, but um, consistently the Highlands and Islands economy has outperformed in terms of uh, some of the employment measures, in terms of very low unemployment, very low levels of employment. Um, but we have seen some challenges, particularly around wage growth, which has been quite poor. Um, I think that is partly a reflection of our economy, which was even more dominated by micro and small businesses and sectors which are traditionally not, not high payers like tourism and food and drink. Um, on a positive note, we have seen productivity gap closed. Um, it's from 87% back in 2008, 87% of the UK average in 2008, and up to 94% in 2016. So we have seen that, which is, which is a positive sign. Uh, in terms of success, I'd also point out uh, inward investment success, uh, organisations like Capgemini and Atos coming to the region, uh, as well as big industrial companies like the Liberty Group in Fort William. So we have seen a lot of activity in that space. Uh, but there, there remain, remain challenges uh, in terms of population growth. Um, like many parts of Scotland, we see an out-migration of young people uh, as, we, as they go for uh, further education and higher educational opportunities. In, in the rest of Scotland, in the UK, uh, the University of the Highlands and Islands has improved its, its offering uh, over the last uh, few years, but we still have a, a, a net outflow of uh, young people. So. OK, thank you. I mean, does Scottish Enterprise see this picture as much the same as Highlands and Islands? Yes, thank you, Convener. So um, we would see a similar picture just in terms of, I guess, the, both the challenges and opportunities that we've seen over the last 10 years in the economy. We've seen certainly particular challenges around oil and gas and financial services. But we've also seen opportunities as well coming in in those sectors. So the diversification um, on the back of the task force work that was being done in financial services. Scotland has continued to do well, particularly in terms of inward investment and also R&D-related inward investment that's coming into Scotland in terms of those sectors. So we have seen a mixed picture around that. I think what we've also seen is some things that have been emerging in terms of matching to where Scotland can compete globally. So things like the Edinburgh Digital Cluster, which is clearly a big part of the Edinburgh City deal in terms of data-driven innovation and Edinburgh being the data capital of Europe. Um, so we've been, over the last 10 years, we've seen that really develop in terms of the assets at University University of Edinburgh and Edinburgh as a city, about the um, Stanford link, Edinburgh Stanford link, and then on the back of that, a cluster of companies really beginning to grow, both very small companies, but also very large companies um, coming in and investing on the back of what they can access here in terms of the um, capability and skills. And we've also seen something around, you know, the kind of food and drink exports. You know, we've seen that hugely grow over that kind of 10 year period. And that's right across Scotland, it's, you know, Highlands Islands as well as the rest of Scotland. And we've seen
seen that grow something like about 56% since 2007. And that's been a real concerted effort by the industry in terms of looking at where the market opportunities are, the types of products that we have in Scotland and how that would play out internationally, and then making sure that they delivered through on that. So there's a, a real kind of um, mixed picture, but real some kind of some challenges that I think we've, we've been looking at, and that has definitely helped that piece that David was talking about in terms of closing the gap in productivity. And some signals, I think, of where the economy could be going in the future that we've got to build on in Scotland going forward. OK, I mean, some of my colleagues will come in with much more <coughs> detailed questions as we go on, but I could maybe just add in at this stage, you know, as well as looking back over the last 10 years, uh, you yourself mentioned the future. Um, what are the key opportunities and risks, do you think, over the next 10 years? Just in a kind of general sense, not getting too specific. Mr Fancy, you're nodding. We talked in the earlier session, uh, the committee talked in the earlier session with uh, Nora Senior about the need to growing exports, to be growing exports in Scotland, to be building on the opportunities that Linda uh, highlighted there, particularly around emerging industries where Scotland has an, a, a domestic growth. So we are generating data-driven innovation uh, led companies, we're generating new uh, food and drink businesses, and I think the future is most definitely to build on that expertise. Uh, if I could take back to your previous question, that what I would have said was that over the last 10 years we've seen a consistency in the support for um, research in Scotland, which has given us a, a university base, which has given us, given us the platform from which the kinds of developments that Linda was referring to have grown. Thank you. Mr McGuinness, yes. <coughs> the, the in terms of the economic performance, would mirror much of what has already been said. I think from a, a labour market point of view, we've seen a growth in what we would term as non-standard employment. Some would refer to it as kind of gig economy. But uh, I think there's a fragility around the elements of employment, particularly for young people, and also underemployment. Uh, Julie Martin mentioned uh, us around graduates and their, their, their skill sets. don't think we're necessarily getting the best return from that. So I think in, in general terms we've seen that and you've seen an increase in the number of self employment registrations but not actually you know companies that are, are up in trading. So there's a fragility to aspects of the labour market we need to take cognizance of. So would you say that fragility is a risk going forward or is it in some ways an opportunity? It, it, it's a risk and, and there's obviously unknowns related to, to Brexit and the impact that that will have in the workforce looking to the future. I think a lot of the policy activity around inclusive growth and fair work is the types of things that we need to promote to uh, employers and the benefits of uh, having a better job job quality. There's I think, a lot of evidence there that leads to better economic performance at a, a, a company level. Okay, thank you. Did anyone else want to come in about the future? Or yes, Ms. Deed. Um, I lead Cooperative Development Scotland, and one of the models we're most actively promoting is employee ownership. Um, so if one look back, we've made a lot of progress over the recent years, uh, admittedly from a low base, to bring the model to the fore in terms of making, increasing awareness in Scotland, such that we're optimistic looking forward that, that a lot more business owners will now actively consider this model. And its attributes are about rooting businesses in Scotland, driving performance, very relevant to this um, inquiry, and sharing the wealth of enterprise more widely. So it's a model that inclusive growth is absolutely in the DNA of the model. It creates opportunities for all and drives growth across the population. OK, thanks so much. Uh, well, I'll, there'll be more detail. We'll go into some of these points, I think, in more detail. So our next question is going to come from Jimmy Halker-Johnson. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm interested in uh, looking back in, in terms of um, the agency's roles within economic performance. So I was just wondering if you could point to, uh, in relation to each of your each of the agencies, point to one or two specific examples um, from each agency where your policies or your um, uh, projects have had a material impact on Scotland's uh, economic um, success or performance. Yes, Hannah. Quite happy to kick off yep. there. Um, so just a couple of examples from Scottish Enterprise. So taking some of the um, evidence you've already had at this committee and looking at our own evidence, particularly in terms of the gaps, in terms of the OECD quartiles, two things that I think that um, we would kind of point to. One is around innovation. So the kind of gap that the, we've moved up a quartile in, in Scotland. So we're now in the second quartile and we used to be in, I think it was the kind of fourth quartile back in 
um, in quarter three in 2012. And one of the things that we've done is particularly look at how we support more companies to be um, the kind of definition that OECD use around innovation active. And really what that means is that companies are actively taking forward different types of innovation. It could be products, it could be processes, it could be the ways that they work. So we've particularly looked at how we could make sure that we're investing more, how that's leveraging more from companies investing, partly around R&D, but also just in terms of other things that help kind of take that forward to market. And certainly, you know, one pound of every four pounds now that's spent on Scottish R&D comes as a result of an AC supported project. So that's been a huge increase in that period of time. <clears throat> so that kind of shift that we've had in Innovation Active we think is incredibly important, partly because of the number of companies that are now doing that and because um, part of the discussion in your last session, the level of innovation and level of exporting are inextric inextricably linked. So making sure that we support companies both to innovate and to enter new markets is really important. So that's something that I certainly would point to in the work that we've done to work with individual companies, groups of companies, industry sectors through the industry leadership groups we've looked at how we can make that journey easier for companies food and drink is a good example of that so so lots of engagement we've done there and the second example that i would point to is about maintaining scotland's position around foreign direct investment so we've maintained our position in the first quartile which given you know the global market is is quite challenging and we've also become the top location, particularly for R&D in, inward investment in the UK. And again, that's something that speaks very much to the approach that we've got around how we can build on the strong academic strengths that we've got in Scotland, the, the company base, so the supply chain base, and the skills base that we've got coming through colleges, schools, and universities. So those are all things that I think we've, we've helped to kind of, and definitely have kind of maintained either a, a, a good position for Scotland or have helped us move up in terms of that quartile position. Right. Is that specifically, is that about marketing Scotland uh, better abroad, or is I mean, what are the specifics behind behind that? So, so it's a mix of things. So on inward investment, it would be about understanding our strengths. So it would be about seeing what is Scotland's capability compared to other parts of the world, and then targeting those markets, particularly in terms of types of inward investors that then might want to come to Scotland, and about putting in front of them why you know Scotland is a good place for them to come and do business. And then once they come here, to kind of talk to them about the support that they would have available. And that's not just about, that. that's about the university base, it's about, as I say, the kind of supply chain, it's about the skills base, and being able to lay out a proposition, if you like, about why this is a great place to do business. And then on the top of that, then, is looking at what types of incentives we might need to provide. There is absolutely a marketing element to that, and that's not just about us, that's about all of our partners, and about universities and others talking about what Scotland is good at, and that's something that we very actively work on with our partners. And in terms of innovation, it's about individual work with companies, so one-to-one -one support that we do. It's also about working with industry leadership groups, as I was saying, about the industry starting to kind of set out what some of those innovation challenges would be. Um, some of the work we do is working with very large companies to um, put out a, almost like an innovation competition. So put out there something that they want solved and then asking Scottish companies if they can come forward and do that and then about how we help them to support them to do that. Okay. Anyone else want to come in? Yes, Mr Oxley. Uh, to support everything that Linda said there, I think it, where I'd like us to focus on is uh, a number of the programmes of support we've, we've uh, run uh, which touch many businesses across the region. Um, programs which are trying to tackle some of those challenges about getting more folks innovating, getting more folks trading internationally. Over the last uh, two and a half years, we've run a program called International Highlands and Islands, which has engaged nearly 500 companies in taking their first stop step or increased steps to, to export more and more product or services. Um, we've run similar programs on Innovate Your Business, where we were looking to encourage businesses to take relatively small steps and think about innovation and deliver some of those programs. Uh, another focus has been uh, leadership development. Um, I think both ourselves and Scottish Enterprise would say that folks often come approach us for money. Quite often what they need is some of the softer but harder to deliver stuff in terms of leadership training. Uh, we've get, we've, we work with many businesses who've got great ideas, maybe coming out of universities or startup businesses, but they need to understand how to operate in a business and commercial environment. So a lot of that leadership program it's been very, uh, very useful. If I could just highlight one particular example where maybe that's all come together in one project, the Isle of Harris Distillers, New Start Distilling Business uh, in the West Niles, started off in 2015 and is approaching £3 million turnover already just from the sales of, of one product, the gin, 
they haven't started selling the whiskey yet. Uh, so we expect that company to be supported uh, further in growth, uh, and will be. We've looked at traditional uh, support in terms of capex development, but a lot of leadership, a lot of international trade support as well. Mr. McGuinness. Yeah, for myself, I think a sustained focus in the promotion of work-based learning. Uh, so we've further developed the apprenticeship model, but we've also introduced foundation apprenticeships in schools, and I think that's going to build a stronger link from young people with a uh, work experience element with, with employers, a uh, real experience there. And I think in, particularly in rural environments, it will create stronger connections between young people. David talked about young people moving away from, uh, from rural areas. I think if the Foundation Apprenticeship, we're already starting to see an impact there of relationships being built. The Graduate Level Apprenticeship as well has been developed over the last three years in partnership with many of our universities and employers. Uh, and I think we're seeing real benefits in that, and that's changing the, the dynamic, getting more young people moulded into uh, the types of characteristics that the employers are, are looking for. And our, our wider service offer, uh, I'd point to the development of our career management skills within our careers service, and that will be a longer term aim, but around issues particularly around equalities and, and gender, then I think we're, you know, we need to start further down the the pipeline, uh, and I'd point to the, the, the two of those. Thank you. I think uh, Jackie Bailey wants to come in with a supplementary in there. Yeah, just, just a small supplementary because I think it was Linda Hanna talked about maintaining inward investment, um, yet we've recorded the fewest number of jobs um, since 2010 from that inward investment, and I think Mr Oxley talked about productivity gap closing, um, but is it not the case that actually it's because the UK's performance has weakened rather than the Scottish um, performance improving? So, you know, when I listen to all the wonderful things that people are saying, I'm kind of wondering why then is our economy flirting with recession if you're doing all these good things? Or is it actually that sometimes there's nothing we can do to stop it? I'll take Anyone? anybody. Ms. Anna? I'll kick off on the inward investment piece. Apologies, I've got a bit of a cold, so my voice is kind of giving out. So on the inward investment, um, our approach very much is looking at, uh, when you look at the kind of global flows there are now around inward investment and where Scotland can compete, um, a number of those projects, as I was saying earlier, are much more around R&D-led, so it does tend to be fewer jobs, but it's, it's kind of better jobs in terms of the value of those jobs that are coming. So higher value, higher wage, higher skill. So, so in terms of the number of projects that are coming, that is holding up. In terms of the R&D projects that's coming, and I think what we are looking at is how we can make sure that Scotland can continue to compete on, on that stage and about how we can make sure that we can keep bringing that to Scotland. But it is the fewest jobs since 2010. I don't have those figures in, in front do. of me. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can also say if there's any questions, specific questions on numbers or anything, people can come back to the committee afterwards in, in writing if you'd like to do so. Uh, does anyone else want to comment on that, Mr McGuinness, again? I think the market for foreign direct investment is uh, competitive just now. There's a very active pipeline just now, which is, is healthy. Uh, but I, I would probably also point to the fact that if the agencies weren't doing all the good things that we're doing, then the situation could be worse than I could point to things like the Energy Jobs Task Force and, and Aberdeen and the response that's been made there, not just for the skills agencies, but into business development that's helping to diversify and opening up new markets. So uh, I think you, there's an overall picture, but I think if you look at individual activities, then there's, there's good stories to be, to be told. Dr Fancy, did you want to come in on that? A brief point, Linda Hannah made the point that uh, many of the inward investment jobs that are arriving are at the high skill end, at the R&D end, and of course part of our job then is to uh, build supply chain relationships so that Scottish suppliers can g gain, uh, if you like, a, a broader spread of value from that investment and create jobs at a, a number of levels. I would be interested, convener, if possible, that we have a breakdown um, of those jobs and whether they are all in R&D and what supply chain um, connections have been made. I think that would be very useful for the committee to know. Right, so the folk for whom that's relevant, if you can come back. I think, Mr Dees, you wanted to say something? Just responding to your question in terms of material impact, um, we're very conscious that as you look at the life cycle of a business, um, particularly Scottish-based businesses, that um, succession is a, a key issue. Um, and particularly as we look at the 
what could be called the succession time bomb as the um, baby boom owners are coming to retirement. It's projected that in the next five years there'll be 16,000 businesses in Scotland where succession will need to be addressed at an ownership level. So we've introduced a new service called Succession Expert Support, which is available to all businesses in Scotland, and we're working with the account managers in Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise to reflect upon um, the succession planning within their businesses and, and bring forward this service. The aim is to root and sustain and use this turning point within a business to drive future growth. Okay, thank you. Jamie, did you want to come back in? Yes, just, just, just quickly. Um, it's, uh, it follows really up on, on, on that. Um, it's estimated that Scotland spends, uh, I think, £120 a head more on enterprise and economic uh, development than the UK average. Given the um, slow economic growth that we're experiencing, is that value for money? Are we going to return investment on that? Anyone? <laughs> Mr. McGuinness, you're always putting your hand up. Answer from, from my point. Uh, uh, Mr. Halco, need to see where the, the figures are coming from. It, it's, it's not a figure I, I broadly recognise. The, the work SDS is doing just now in, in the earlier session uh, with Nora, uh, the question was asked around evidence. So, as an example of how we're trying to evidence the return on investment, we've worked with OECD to create an evaluation framework. We're going to be linking our data and our uh, flow of young people into the labour market to both the DWP and to HMR HMRC data, which will give us a longitudinal view of the return we get in investment in young people, particularly around apprenticeship programmes. So we're working through the Centre for Work-Based Learning with that and with colleagues in the Funding Council to see if that model can be applied to, to other areas. And that, that should give us a much better picture of what the long-term investment would look like. Our individual uh, evaluation with those individuals are also looking at their well-being in terms of the benefits of, of work as well. So it's, it's, a, it's a fairly broad study, so it's good quality data. Okay. I responded from my perspective. Um, Scotland has seemed to be punching above its weight in terms of cooperative development. Um, yes, we are investing more in the work of promoting cooperatives and employee ownership, but it's playing off in terms of the number of businesses are now actively looking at the model. And um, it does, does give us the opportunity in terms of progressive business practices and positioning of Scotland in the world to, to differentiate our economy based upon the, the desire for inclusive growth. Mr. Oxley, did you want to comment on this one as well? Yeah, I was just going to say that I, I, I think I'd answer yes, that we have made a, a big difference in, in, the, in the value of money, what we, we deliver. The, we support many uh, big projects in, in a slightly different way. So our core budget is relatively small in the in the scheme of things, but we've invested £146 million in broadband infrastructure uh, through the uh, Next Generation Broadband Programme, and that has set the, the um, foundations for business growth across the whole region. If we hadn't invested that, there would be no superfast broadband in many of the island locations in Scotland. There is now. It's in the Highlands and Islands, it's over 90% in most areas. Uh, so that, 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 that is a, an investment that we've spent now and we will see the benefit in future. So things like that take a long term to, to develop. You okay with that, Jamie? Yeah. Yes, Sorry. okay. Uh, well, next question comes from Andy Whiteman. Uh, thanks very much, <clears throat> and convener. Uh, we've heard, in fact, I think we touched on it in the earlier session about the, um, the weak performance of, of business research and development in Scotland. I'm just wondering if you have any insights as to why why that's the case. Um, I'll kick off on that question and then probably hand over to Stuart to kind of add to that. So Scotland, so just in terms of business R&D, Scotland has a particularly kind of small manufacturing sector in terms of the totality of that sector. And, and traditionally quite a lot of R&D would come from the kind of part of the economy that kind of makes things. Increasingly, that's changing in terms of service R&D, but particularly in terms of research and development. So most of that is carried out by manufacturers. And with, within what the work we've been doing is about working with that manufacturing population to look at how they could improve that. As Dave has already hinted, that a number of the things that impact on um, both our export performance and our innovation performance, it has often to do with kind of management and leadership capabilities and also levels of broader investment going into companies. Because to invest in R&D, to get into new markets, 
you need to make sure that the, the business is well financed and has a very kind of clear plan for action. So that interdependency that was talked about in the last session, I think does impact on R&D and the level of R&D in Scotland. So to improve that R&D performance, um, certainly from our perspective, what we are looking at is how can we make sure we grow the parts of our economy that are much more likely to do R&D and be more successful at it. And a bit of that is about manufacturing, but it is about service development. And we know that foreign owned companies, of which Scotland is competitive, and we just we just talked about that, we know that they're much more likely to invest in R&D. So how do we make sure that we continue to bring in even more inward investment that is R&D, and I think then grow that in terms of the supply chain? How do we encourage more of the sectors that I think um, traditionally have been low R&D performers to make sure that we encourage them to do that? And we have been doing quite a bit of that. And, and, and I guess I think the other thing is just about making sure that the mid-sized businesses that, that Nora was talking about earlier, as we start to see companies start, grow, keep growing, mid-sized and kind of growth, that they build into that very much a focus that's outward looking, international, and R&D focused in terms of being innovation led. Dr. Fancy, did you want to come in as well? Yep. The company based in Scotland, as, as Linda has described it, um, is not traditionally investing a huge amount in, in R&D, absolutely. So some of the things that we've been doing in partnership with Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise is to it, open up the support mechanisms that the universities and increasingly the colleges are able to offer to the small, small and medium-sized business base in particular, where that uh, culture of investment in R&D or perhaps a confidence to invest in R&D has been lacking. So we've been using mechanisms such as Interface, for example, which is an introduction agency, a, 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 a place where small businesses can be helped to find uh, support to introduce the, the value of R&D investment and to reduce the risk uh, and uh, and expense of, of making those initial steps. And over the last uh, years of Interface's operation, 4,000 small Scottish businesses have met a university and worked with them uh, for the first time as a result of that activity. We've looked at specific sectors where either there are um, emerging R&D intensive business areas, uh, as again, as Linda mentioned, so whether data science, for example, or indeed Scottish industries where innovation is most definitely necessary in order to solve challenges of competitiveness or or to improve the uh, the value of what Scottish businesses are producing, so the areas of agriculture, those kinds of areas. And, and we built innovation centres around them, which are university business partnerships to help businesses to work with uh, universities more closely. And that's been a partnership, again, across the strategic board over the last uh, four or five years to make those opportunities available. But it is an incremental business of helping businesses recognise that value and then broadcast that value to, uh, to each other. So we're very acutely aware of the business-to-business the -business communication that building clusters brings, and we see the universities and colleges as being integral to those clusters that hopefully help with generating some kind of self-fulfilling self confidence boost. And, and specifically in relation to the Scottish Funding Council, I mean, do you see the Strategic Board as providing an opportunity to enhance the role that higher education plays in R&D? Uh, absolutely. Uh, positioning the uh, higher education sector uh, and also the colleges in the uh, economic support system of the, uh, of the country is extremely important and one that we look to the strategic board to help us with and to lower any, any possible um, barriers to them participating fully in that. Okay, I think, could I bring in Gordon MacDonald? I think he's got a sure. point on this, is that right? Yeah. I, I just want to ask a, a question. Uh, bearing in mind what you've said about 4,000 small companies um, are now got research and development projects underway. Um, traditionally, it tends to have been larger companies that have had the resource in order to spend in research and development. And given that Scotland only has 0.4% um, of all of its enterprises that are considered to be large businesses, is there a, is, is how much of an impact does that have on the lack of R&D spend in terms of the small number of large businesses and is there any aspect in terms of the, the number of Scottish headquartered businesses because decision making is no longer within the, the Scottish area? I, I'm no economist, but uh, I have no doubt, and my understanding is that that is relevant, absolutely. So our role in helping the further and higher education sectors to contribute to the growth of the Scottish economy is to work, or to help those sectors to work in primarily with smaller businesses, which is challenging because smaller businesses are, uh, they don't have R&D directors, they don't have uh, the, some of the capacity to do that kind of thing. So we're trying to take 
um, almost offer them that support outside and to integrate it with the work that the enterprise agencies do so that smaller businesses feel that they have wraparound support from the Scottish public sector. And again, that's where the uh, strategic board is critical in helping us to work with each other to help that to happen. Okay, I'll go back to Andy Whiteman. Yep. Okay, thanks. Um, Linda, you mentioned um, getting companies to, to grow and, and, and be more out, out, outward looking. Um, I mean, as Gordon MacDonald said, the economy is dominated by small and medium enterprise and, and uh, enterprises, and as Nora Senior said, even by micro uh, enterprises. How, how do we compare with other countries in terms of the structure of the size of business and particularly the rate at which they grow? So I don't have the figures on all of those, and we can follow up and give those to you. But certainly, um, from what I'm aware, our self-employment rate is growing and growing faster than certainly other parts of the UK. Um, and that is good because that's a high level of entrepreneurship. It often gives people quite a lot of flexibility and independence at a point of their career when they're doing that. But as, as Nora highlighted, what we're not seeing is that those startups are then growing, keep growing, getting to mid-sized businesses and scaling. And that's been a persistent challenge for Scotland for certainly since um, the last kind of 10, 15 years. So we know that is a challenge. So the structure of our business base in terms of a high number of self-employment, small number, you know, kind of micro businesses, and then a small number of businesses that kind of carry on growing to scale is something that has um, certainly been a, an area of attention by the enterprise agencies for, for a number of years. So what I think we do need to make sure that we do is look at and you mentioned other economies where they are able to look at how they support companies to do that. So the work that we've been doing certainly around um, scaling up programmes um, at the startup end and then the mid-sized and then into global companies um, is beginning, you know, we've seen some examples of success there and what we need to make sure is that we continue to do that and also learn from companies who do that, not necessarily with public intervention. As Nora mentioned, this is, you know, uh, uh, this needs to be private sector led as well and how we can encourage much more of that. The patient capital and something we've advocated for quite a long time, having patient capital around those businesses is really important and we very welcome the attention of that in the Scottish National Investment Bank. So making sure all the ingredients that are going to be there to encourage the entrepreneur to be mentored either you know, by it could be by the public sector, but actually preferably peer to peer is what actually makes a difference. So those kind of things in place, finance in place, um, access to markets, and increasingly around our export um, a, a approach. What we're thinking about is not just saying to companies, "Here's a range of trade opportunities." It's actually about saying, "Here's how we'll help you in terms of the specifics of that trade development for your business, and about how we help them to do that." And certainly, a big part of the support around food and drink was about making sure that the people in market could then talk to food and drink companies in their language about how they would be able to kind of access that. So I think there's a range of things that we need to make sure that we do around um, dealing with some of those structural issues that we've got in our economy and how we're able to kind of deal with that. I think linked to that as well though is the fact that we do have a rural and geographically dispersed economy which can be different to different countries, other countries. So it's also just about how we make sure that we kind of play that into the needs of those communities, the needs of those businesses and increasingly it's come up a lot this morning the role of digital and being able to get onto digital platforms can start to actually dissolve boundaries that used to be there and the more that we can make sure that infrastructure is there digital infrastructure digital skills and that the businesses know how to use it the more it can start to overcome those issues and actually help businesses grow much faster than they were ever able to do before so we've seen in recent years some uh, businesses in Scotland that have come, startups that have grown very fast, uh, won't mention any names, but um, some of them have then been sold. Um, now, is that a concern in terms of Scotland's economic performance going forward? Uh, would we rather those companies remained under <coughs> um, Scottish ownership, or, or does, does, that, does that not matter? Let's start with that one. I think we, we have seen companies a few companies grow like that and I think what we've seen from a, a local perspective in, in some of those is that that has, when that sale happens quite often you churn employees there who go off and start their own business and they've got that great experience from going through it starting off with a, a small company and ending up with a very large company and they want to do it again and uh, we see that particularly in the life sciences sector in Inverness where Inverness Medical 20 years ago grew and grew and became LifeScan and we've had a number of companies that have come out of the R&D facility 
of uh, of, in, of Inverness Medical and, and LifeScan to to grow and develop, and they've got that ex they they get that experience of experience in first hand what it's like to go through that. So we I don't see a huge amount of angles of folks going away and sitting in at home with the the cash in the bank. They usually want to invest again. Yes. Yep. yes, indeed. Um, we're seeing increasing interest in employee ownership from business leaders who are concerned about um, acquisition of their business as they retire, either from within the UK or internationally, um, who are concerned about rooting it within its community in Scotland and, and are choosing employee ownership for that reason. Just taking one example, I know there's a few businesses that have submitted um, evidence to this inquiry and each one has, has raised this as a concern. Um, one of those was Klansman Dynamics. Um, when they came to address ownership succession, they were being approached by three international um, competitors, two from Germany and one from Italy. And uh, their concern was that with 90%, 97% of their output being sold with, uh, out with the UK, they're in the robotics uh, and foundry sectors, uh, that that could have led to um, a concern that an acquisition would take the production from Scotland and the jobs also. Um, and in their evidence to this committee, they've highlighted what um, has happened over those subsequent five years in terms of those competitors and the implication it would have had for Scotland. So I think rooting businesses and driving performance and sharing the wealth is, is the attraction of this model. And um, looking at it from the perspective of structure of the economy, it enables us to grow, steadily grow more businesses into that mid-size that is the gap in terms of our industrial structure in Scotland. Okay, thanks. I think Gillian Martin's got a supplementary on this. Absolutely ideal point for me to ask my next question, which is about steadily growing. And one of the feed bits of feedback I get is the convener of the Women's Enterprise is cross-party group from female-led businesses is when they go uh, for business support, that they are being asked to grow too fast than they are comfortable with, that the targets are uh, not are things that worry them, and they are actually more interested in having steady, sustainable growth that they are comfortable with. And therefore, they feel that when they go for um, business support, they've been asked to come out with their comfort zone because the focus is always on super fast growth. And I would like to hear your responses to that, particularly Scottish Enterprise, because you are mentioned in those testimonies a lot around this. Thank you very much. I'll kick that off then. So, so in terms of our approach to working with companies, um, I, I would be surprised if we're pushing people much beyond their comfort zone. Our job, though, is to be challenging and ambitious and to make sure that we support any business, whether it's women-led or not, in terms of looking at what their growth plans are and how that kind of sits in the market and bringing things to the table that would challenge them. But at the end of the day, that business is run by that, that, that entrepreneur or that management team, and our job is to support them to achieve that. Um, so, so I would be, and I would be interested in hearing some of those examples, actually, just in terms of where where that's led to and why um, those businesses have then not taken that forward. Yeah, Women's Enterprise Scotland published reports are around that um, frequently, but what we're finding is that some some women-led businesses are, are saying that they have not been able to access support because their targets haven't been at the super fast growth. Uh, level that is that they feel is, is required and therefore there's almost like they almost have to talk up a business beyond what you can actually achieve in order to even get through the door and, and that's been something that's come out from quite a lot of people that I've spoken to, to, to us. I think from, from our plan's perspective we, we try and work with businesses that have got the ambition is the, is the, the benchmark, the hurdle you've got to get over rather than a, a specific turnover or job creation level because uh, we, we don't have huge numbers of big business or even medium-sized business, so we work with a portfolio of clients which is generally smaller than Scottish Enterprise in terms of that. Um, but we do have... Um, there are challenges in the number of women, women in business, uh, certainly at senior level. Social enterprises tend to do more. It's, it's not quite a 50-50 split in social enterprises, but it's not far off. For other sectors, tourism and food and drink, it's reasonable. Oil and gas is very low um, in terms of female-led entrepreneurs and chief executive officers um, but we we are trying to um, utilize good examples of where that where a female-led company has has grown and developed 
um, in perhaps in traditional sectors like brewing and distilling, where we've got a number of uh, small companies in that sector that have, uh, are female-led. I've got a very uh, ambitious uh, growth aspirations, and we're utilising those to encourage and promote that opportunity to more companies. But I mean, can, I just, can I just come in and ask you, you use the word ambitious mm -hmm. there. I mean, are you open to people expressing their ambitiousness in different ways? Yeah. Ab absolutely. If, if, um, turnover related? If, we, if we created um, 100 jobs in Inverness, that's great, but is that more important than 10 jobs in, in Stornoway or two jobs in Barra? Uh, we, we look at all of that in every investment that we do. We recognise that creating all the jobs in investors is not the right answer for the Highlands and Islands, because we, we do disproportionately invest more in the more rural areas. Okay, sorry, Gillian, you were going to come back in. Yeah. You asked my oh, supplementary sorry, sorry. question, Joy, and I'm nodding along. A apologies for that. So. Uh, back to Andy. Right, when were you finished, or do yes, you want to? You're, you're okay with that just now. Right, well, I think the next question is from Dean Lockhart. Uh, th thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask about performance targets. We, we've um, heard today about uh, inclusive growth being one of the government's priorities, and looking at the letters of, of guidance from ministers to the agencies, inclusive growth is uh, prioritised in terms of the guidance given from ministers to agencies. So I'd like to ask, um, how does each agency define inclusive growth for, for the purpose of uh, pursuing this agenda, and how do you measure changes in inclusive growth on a on a year to year basis? So, oh. partic so particularly in terms of inclusive growth, um, for Scottish enterprise, what, and it's something that was relatively recently, I, I think, kind of introduced as a term in Scotland, and, and I think it's quite fair to say that that definition isn't a common definition across. Um, the different parts of the system and everyone's been looking at particularly in terms of our unique contribution what that means and I do know that Scottish Government has been looking at an inclusive growth framework which they're still developing and um, we're kind of um, hopeful and interested just to see how that's going to align with the national performance framework that, that's happening at the moment but certainly from our perspective I guess what we think about is particularly about inclusive growth is something that encapsulates both economic and social value. So, so it's not just about create growth and then make it inclusive. It's about the ways that we deliver growth that will be in, uh, inclusive for people and different communities and geographies. So we've thought very much along, along the lenses in terms of what Scottish Enterprise does is, you know, what we do is we work with companies, we work with sectors, and we work with different kind of geographies or places, if you like, um, and, you know, different communities are, are more comfortable with different words in there. So the work that we do with companies is very much about looking at uh, the workforce and the workplace. So thinking about in the conversations with companies about their growth plans, you know, we're, we're talking to them about the types of progressive workplace practices they have, the type of business model that they have, and, and how inclusive that is in terms of the growth opportunities. We will talk to them about um, invest in youth policies and about, and that could be about employing young people, but equally it could be about, you know, do they talk to their schools? Are they engaging with the colleges? Are they kind of thinking about those kinds of things as well? Are they mentoring young people? So we will talk to them about that. Um, we are, uh, and we have been looking at, you know, monitoring the number of, or beginning to track some things around inclusive growth, which I'll kind of come back to. Um, so, so that kind of conversation with companies is very much about the workforce and the workplace in terms of fair work. In terms of sectors, we've been working with industry leaders groups to help them to build and embed in their strategy different ways of looking at inclusive growth going forward and about how that starts to kind of make sure that stretches that. And I think particularly in terms of the productivity plan work that we've done with construction, food and drink and tourism, that very much was about by the industry, for the industry, starting to see how are they going to tackle, particularly in lower productivity sectors, some of the big issues that there are around making growth more, much more inclusive in different communities. And certainly in terms of our, the, the agenda just around regional and place, you know, we're absolutely engaging uh, on an individual level, partly with local authorities, and we do that around community plan partnerships. We look at community benefit clauses as part of the work that we do in big projects, where we look at, in terms of something, if you take something like the Edinburgh Biocorter, um, which is not far from here, you know, we, we very much thought about how is that going to engage with the community there on all sorts of levels, schools, um, you know, kind of graduate routes and all sorts of other things, as well as engaging with that community that's on site. 
oversight, and we're very much engaged in the regional economic partnership work. Either a good example would be Ayrshire, but also in terms of the city deal work, and about how does that then actually make sure that the people and uh, the different kind of parts of that community is able to engage with it. So, th so that's the kind of way that we look at it, and we embed it in what we do. What we have done is we don't have a single measure on inclusive growth, not least because we've been trying to make sure that what we, we have we're going to be able to track through. And this year in our business plan, we're going to be introducing a number of tracking measures around inclusive growth, which I can follow up and share with you, that will give us a baseline around some things that we can learn from, as well as then use as a baseline to track and then help us to understand what, what's, because if you have the wrong measure, it can set the wrong behaviour, what's the, the right kind of measure that would actually help us to be able to track our performance on inclusive growth going forward? Yes, Ms. Lewis. To um, give one example, so one of those measures is um, the number of cooperatives, employee-owned and social enterprise businesses that we support. Um, so we're, we're setting the measures just at this moment. From Looking forward from that, from my perspective, where I'd like to take some further research in Scotland is around the productivity benefits, particularly associated with employee ownership. There's international research that shows that um, employee-owned businesses are 5 to 10% more productive than their peers under a more conventional model, um, and that that productivity benefit is sustained. Given where we are in terms of the adoption of this model in Scotland, it will be very interesting to start to track that um, productivity benefit um, in terms of Scottish employee-owned businesses. So can, can I ask you, would you say an employee-owned business understands inclusive growth better than other forms of business? Um, it's, it's very much part of the DNA. Principally, um, when a business moves into employee ownership, an, a trust is established, and it's that trust that acts as an anchor um, for the business. Um, for today and to tomorrow's employees, it's, it addresses is, is addresses succession um, immediately. The employees all then have a stake in the business, either directly or through owning shares. You can have a combination of both, and it's that sense of ownership, uh, that sense of of uh, purpose and understanding the mission of the business that makes it an inclusive model and um, brings forward ideas, driving innovation, or reduces inefficiency also driving productivity that um, makes the model particularly high performance in terms of productivity gain. And clearly, in terms of the inclusive point, it's about sharing the wealth more widely. It's keeping um, profits and dividends within a community that are, then drives a multiply effect within that community in terms of local spend. OK, thanks, Mr McGuinness. Uh, I think the recognition that the actual model is still evolving. Uh, my team have a meeting with the government team this afternoon uh, on this, uh, we've piloted work with the three Ayrshire local authorities around it and taken the inclusive growth model down to a kind of locality planning basis. So that was highlighting things like the lack of digital skills as a barrier to the labour market, accessibility of, of childcare, that, that type of thing. For us, I think it's about fully understanding our customer base. So the level of targeted services that we would have for young people with kind of protected characteristics and understanding how we can support them through the system, make sure that uh, the system connects up better, particularly when we're working with, with partners, probably around earlier intervention with that client group. Uh, I touched on the development of the Foundation Apprenticeship uh, model earlier, which just creates a different uh, operating model and gives us more exposure to young people with uh, additional uh, work experience and, and, and real time experience uh, and I think if applying that into things like the kind of attainment gap in schools which is obviously a big focus for uh, local authorities and education Scotland so there's a number of areas where we need to work across uh, organisations in terms of partnerships and make sure their systems connect up and at a, a local authority area but I think it's still a, an evolving framework for us Okay, Dean, do you, sorry, Mr. Oxley. Yeah, yeah I just uh, want to add to points that others have made. Uh, I think inclusive growth can mean many things to many people, but I think Nora earlier mentioned uh, gender, geogra geography, and generational, uh, and I think that's a pretty good definition of how we want to try and reduce inequalities across those three areas. Um, we do a lot of work in, in monitoring where our businesses and social enterprises, and, and social enterprises account for roughly 25% of our account managed portfolio how they are in terms of um, their business values and their progressive uh, practices within that, and that could be everything from 
number of young people, gender equality on the board, um, type of th things like that. Uh, in particular, in terms of social enterprises, we often invest for the social impact rather than the financial impact. Uh, although we do encourage businesses, social enterprises, to be to focus on the enterprise as much as the social, because it's important to get the balance right. Uh, and we are increasingly uh, looking to put the social impact uh, benefits into many of our construction projects, for example. I can't give the detail of the name because it's within a, a, a 10 day stand down period on the last project we've announced, but um, that the, the company that won that uh, was head and shoulders above the, the other competitors in terms of their social impact, and that, that's only helped. Thank you. Dr. Fancy? The, uh, perhaps the, the greatest meaning of inclusive growth in the work that we do is recognising that the biggest significant, biggest uh, contribution that the universities and colleges make to the economy is through the graduates that they produce, the, the people who are educated in those institutions and then enter the economy in one way or another. So therefore, in inclusive growth and inclusivity for us is very much bound up with uh, ensuring that the um, opportunities for people in Scotland uh, are inclusive, that the access to further and higher education is um, uh, fair and uh, equal to everybody. So a huge amount of our work in this area has been around uh, working with the, the Commissioner for Finding Access, working with our colleagues in, in SDS and, and with the universities and colleges directly on widening participation, on ensuring that we, uh, that we don't let up on, on giving uh, the same opportunity to all young people. So that's hugely important for us. It doesn't mean that we aren't interested in other, some other things as well. I'm very, very pleased that in the work that we do to help universities uh, start companies, so we're extremely good at spinning out companies from the Scottish universities, and that's something they should be proud of. The participation in that spin-out process, when we look at it, for example, through the Converge Challenge competition, that's very increasingly gender equal, and it matters hugely to us that that is the case. So the more businesses we can start that are led by people from all backgrounds and from all uh, genders, the better. Thank you. Dean? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks very much for that feedback. One of um, Audit Scotland's findings in the Enterprise Review was that it's difficult to measure the impact of enterprise and skill spend in Scotland. We have a budget of 2.5 billion a year or whatever it might be. Um, given that the definition of inclusive growth is not settled, given it means different things to different people, and given it's difficult to measure changes in inclusive growth, do you agree <clears throat> sorry, with the concerns that the, the, the focus on inclusive growth doesn't necessarily address the concern raised by Audit Scotland that the impact of enterprise spend will continue to be difficult to monitor, <coughs> the, the impact of the spend? Maybe Scottish Enterprise can start. Yeah, if you want, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Convener. Um, so certainly from we will continue to track from a Scottish enterprise perspective for every pound we spend what return we get and we do that as a combination of evaluation evidence through real-time insights that we get on working with the companies that we have and obviously tracking individual projects. So it's a combination of those things that we bring together for our evidence base and, and you'll have seen that um, here at this committee. Um, the strategic board gives an opportunity for us to be able to, I think, um, in the work that's going to be done around bringing that together across all of the agencies around what are we doing I was going to say separately and collectively. So what are the things that we're doing individually and what contribution is that making to the outcome that we seek for the economy? And what are the things that we're doing collectively? Innovation centres would be a really good example where we are certainly, um, Highlands Annals Enterprise, ourselves and the Funding Council, working together around those innovation centres to tackle particular opportunities and challenges with Scotland and with the business base. And that links to a number of things that have already been discussed around R&D and innovation and exports. Um, and I think it's collectively, so it's I think it, making sure that certainly an individual agency needs to be able to um, hold ourselves to account for every pound that we're given to spend of the public purse and demonstrate that impact. But I think the strategic board needs to then collectively be able to demonstrate that. Having said that, there are a number of dependencies that are out with our control that happen in the economy that impact on that. Part of it is the whole system piece. And we talked about Business Gateway earlier. We've talked about local authorities and city deals as well. And I think it's about there is a combination of other kind of levers that kind of have an impact on the economy that we just need to make sure that we understand the totality of that in terms of driving forward um, the whole Scottish picture that we're looking for. Anyone else wanting to come in on that one? Or, yes, <coughs> Mr. Uh, I think in terms of measurement, we're pretty clear. We, we use the national performance framework. There might be an issue around articulation between the, the our KPIs within that back into the inclusive growth framework, but I'm pretty uh, clear that we've got a good set of, of measurements there. 
in specific areas, things like the quality action plan, again, they, we manage and measure that well. We have the participation measure, which is the, the common measure now of, of where young people are uh, in their journey into employment, and that's a shared data set with DWP and the colleges and, and local authorities. So we've got, I think, good metrics around how we, we measure performance, and so we need to look at the kind of context of the Audit Scotland uh, statement. Okay, Dean? Yep. Yep, thank you. Right, thanks, thanks. so much. Next question is from Gordon MacDonald. Thanks very much, convener. Um, we've talked very, uh, an awful lot this morning about productivity, and we've, we've heard that productivity compared to the UK average is, is improving, and we're certainly better than a lot of other parts of the UK in terms of productivity. But my question is, what, what are the sectors that have um, low-skilled and often low-productivity, and what are each of the agencies doing to try and improve productivity in those areas? Everyone's looking down at the moment. Does anyone like to go with that one? <laughs> so, it's always you, Ms Hannah, starting I'm off. I'm happy to kick that off. So, so certainly, and I mentioned earlier, um, some of the sectors where we definitely have low productivity um, and high employment actually is construction, food and drink and tourism and the work that we've all done as agencies working with the industry leadership groups has been to set out some productivity plans about how they could start to address that and I think the three that are, are currently in place were all launched in 2016 so we're beginning to see some of that work coming through in terms of the type of action that they're taking. Um, some of that is about you know investment in leadership and management, some of that's about application of technology Construction is a brilliant example of that around the construction centre, innovation centre that, that um, is invested in by the public purse to make sure the kind of things like off site manufacturing and about the kind of advances of that globally, also making that industry much more attractive to, um, to young people and women because of the kind of shifts that that makes about making um, a construction related things in a factory as opposed to on site. Um, some of the efficiencies that brings in terms of doing that and about the, you know, the opportunity to address societal challenges, challenges like using sensor technology plus the kind of construction fabric that then let you kind of create homes that can start to kind of um, link to some of the challenges that we have today. So, so construction is a really good example where that has happened. In food and drink, you know, a big part of that productivity challenge has been about helping companies to grow and about in moving up the value chain, what that means they can then do in terms of wage levels. In, in that industry. So I think there's certainly some things there and in tourism um, the work that we've done particularly looking at destinations as part of that kind of tourism productivity. So we've we've certainly worked with um, places like Glasgow and Dundee and Aberdeen to look at the destination and how we can work with tourism businesses to collectively work together. We've worked with about 800 of those businesses over the last couple of years and what that again has done uh, with the adoption of looking at data and digital approaches, so tourism businesses getting online, how they're able to kind of sell and, and uh, promote their business online, as well as the kind of destination development of that, that's allowed that kind of growth. So there's a couple of things there. I think there's definitely an opportunity for us to be taking the learning from that, uh, and now that those have been in place for a couple of years, and think about what are some of the common themes coming out of that, and there are common themes about investment and digital and leadership and then saying, how could we apply that to some of the other sectors like retail or care? And then saying, you know, what would it take to do that? And in the new system that we've got in, in terms of enterprise and skills, what would we need to do to then to take that forward? Before we go on to the other um, witnesses, I was just wanting to ask you about construction in particular. Um, about five or six years ago, I, I had the opportunity to go and visit, I think it's CCG in Canvas Lang, and that was a fantastic resource. but. I don't see there's been a, a lot of improvement on that. I mean, the benefits were obvious in terms of downtime duty weather on site, etc., and the, the fact that they could put together a, a house or a flat within a very short period of time that was wind and waterproof. Um, but there doesn't seem to have been a huge change. If you go around building sites today, it still tends to be the timber frames and working on site that has the usual downtime. So. We know there is a model out there that would make construction more efficient, but we don't seem to be moving very fast away from the traditional model. Is there any particular reason for that? 
So I think some of that is just about the length of time it does take for an industry to completely change the model that it has. Um, some of the work we've, and if you've not been out to the Construction um, Innovation Centre, I would really kind of encourage you to do that and we can set that up for you. But some of the work that we've been doing with them has kind of set up something called Offsite Solutions Scotland, which is absolutely looking at how is Scotland going to be able to take advantage of both the Scottish and UK aspirations around new house building and how do we start to kind of do that. So I think... You're right, you know, the whole industry hasn't moved yet, but there are definitely some things that I think that we can uh, build on. And it's then just about how we start to kind of make sure that that's known. And a big part of the Innovation Centre is about raising awareness um, in terms of the companies they work with. They've got a membership model about working with construction companies to come and see, and they've got demonstration facilities so you can see the equipment and you can play with it and all that kind of stuff. So it's then just about, I think, making sure that we help many more companies then think about how you know, taking, making the investment they'll need to make for the long term is the right route rather than doing what they've always done in the past. Yeah, thanks. George, did you want to come in on that one? Yeah, I think in terms of the, the sectors, some of the ones that Linda mentioned, in terms of tourism, food and drink, absolutely. Um, in tourism, we've put a huge amount of effort into um, enabling businesses to take advantage of the, the broadband roller that I mentioned previously, uh, supporting many companies to think more about their customers around this waiting for folks to turn up, but actually targeting the right level of customers who are going to wealthier customers, they're going to spend more, often that's international visitors. Uh, it's and having a proper marketing approach to that. In terms of a couple of other sectors that I would mention, uh, sectors like forestry and timber, there are great opportunities for the use of technology within there to, so you can choose, rather than just felling a whole wood, you choose the right tree to sell, fell at the right time which gets you a better yield from that particular product uh, and it increases the productivity in that. So uh, we are to continue to work with a number of the big tor uh, forestry companies in the in the region. And finally, creative industries is a is a sector that's dominated by individuals. So you, often there are productivity challenges with that. Uh, we've, we've had success in uh, the creative industries networks that we run, which are uh, increasingly becoming rather than being just a network of writers or musicians or games producers or whatever it is, actually working together so that you can get a, a games company that needs a musician to write the, mu the music for their game. And that, that's where we've seen a lot of success for so that. That collaboration amongst very, very small companies, often individuals, is a really important way of getting growth because you can't, you can't really grow a musician from one person to two people, but you can get them to work in a different way, but using their talents. Uh, Ms. Dees? Yes, just building up on, on that. Um, my team works with the sector teams within Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise, helping promote collaboration using the consortium cooperative model. And the, the majority of our clients are in the um, tourism, creative industries and food and drink sectors. Um, a couple of examples of strategic projects would be Argyll and Isles, the Tourism Alliance, which is helping tourism businesses to collaborate and achieve more in terms of scale. Um, and recently in the food and drink industry, the Made in Scotland Consortium, which is helping Scottish food and drink companies to take their products internationally, pooling their resources to access international markets. Okay. Uh, Dr. Fancy. I could bring one more uh, sector to, to this uh, uh, discussion, which is health and social care, particularly perhaps social care in that uh, lower uh, skill end. There's a huge opportunity for increasing the, uh, both the quality of care and the, and the efficiency of it um, through using technology and through rethinking uh, some of the models of the way in which it's delivered. So another one of the innovation centres that we support with the two enterprise agencies is the Digital, digital, health, innovation, digital health and Care Innovation Centre, which is absolutely looking at questions of remote uh, support, uh, questions of using technology in the kind of construction of houses that uh, Linda was referring to, so that we can improve the quality of care whilst at the same time in, in improving the value for money to the, the Scottish purse of providing that care in Scotland. So the resources that the universities and colleges are providing to those innovation centres is critical for underpinning some of that improvement. But uh, a point that I think can't be stressed enough, the link between the uh, improvement of technology or the improvement of processes and then the skills that, that the future workforce needs in order to operate in that environment and make it uh, ensure it has the maximum value is very important to us and across the strategic board and through the devices such as the innovation centres we're making that link as strongly as we can. Mr McGuinness did you want to comment on this? Yeah just the, I mean, 
I think all the kind of contributions have reflected those kind of partnerships through the industry leadership groups and some of the like. The Scottish Tourism Alliance has been a great industry partner as is Food and Drink Scotland. At the end of the day, you still need individual business leaders or management teams to make that commitment to, to make the make the changes. So you can have a central approach, but you're also needing to work at an individual company level and you know, SMAS, Scottish Manufacturing Advisory Service does great work in that space, but you need the commitment to come from the, the companies and Nora touched on that a little earlier, just about, you know, getting up to the kind of level of the value chain a bit more sophisticated in terms of their uh, their approach and I think too many companies stick with the same old process that's what you're describing in construction. Okay Gordon, yep. uh, next one's Gillian Martin. So I really want to concentrate on skills as I always do when Gordon McGuinness is in the room. Um, I mentioned to you know the senior around the, the issue of uh, people that are not young having to reskill people with family commitments, with mortgages, with, you know, and, and in, in work upskilling. I'm very conscious of the work that's been done around apprenticeships, and you've mentioned that today, and you've mentioned young people a lot. But what about the people that are maybe preparing to change career? I mean, that's that, that's a real <coughs> issue. And that's something that we had focus groups recently and there was a couple of, of people at the focus group I was at who felt that they had missed the boat in terms of training and very difficult to get back in whilst maintaining a job. <coughs> it's an area at a UK level where, you know, there's, there's not been huge amounts of resource uh, spent on that. We have recently reintroduced the individual training account which gives a subsidy of up to £200 as a kind of kickstart to some of that, that, that training. And that's, that's been received well. We've, we've tightened the criteria a little just to make it more probably focused on, on labour market uh, requirements. Uh, personally, I think, uh, and Jamie touched on it earlier, uh, we've been through a process where youth unemployment was bad and we focused a lot of resources on, on, on young people, particularly through the colleges. And I see the colleges as a mechanism for that second chance back into, into learning. We've got a fantastic college estate now. I think we need to think constructively in terms of how we free that up. And you know, most, not all, but most college buildings are closed at weekends, and that's when people who are in work or do have family commitments can create a bit of space. We've seen some colleges respond differently. I, I sit on the board of uh, Clyde College, and they've got a particular programme running for childminders just now because childminders are occupied Monday to Monday to Friday normally. And that's a good take up. So I think we need to think constructively on how we can use the resources that we do have. And I think the other issue with the flag is, is kind of online learning. I've seen some innovative practices coming to the market through the kind of commercial route. And I think there's definitely an angle there, but it's, a, it's an area. I think as we begin to and look at the impact of technology and changing and how we help people adapt, rather than waiting until we're helping them through a kind of pace intervention, there should be earlier, uh, an earlier framework of engagement for them. We do provide all age guidance, so the one thing that is available as a constant is that the guidance process is to help people think around their skills, but I think we could probably do more in terms of the, the delivery of those. And Nora Senior mentioned that she felt that businesses maybe weren't doing enough to upskill their employees when they were there. I'd be interested in, in anyone's views on that. Certainly that was something that, that, that chimed with me. Yeah, I think it, it is often a challenge. Uh, and I th we, we try and work in a holistic uh, way with all the companies that we work with. So we identify um, the opportunities and the challenges that they've got. And often leadership is one of the, the big things that they need. Um, we, we're running a, a leadership program with various levels within an organisation. The most popular part of that is emerging leaders, so that's your people who are doing their first their first career, the first job where they've had to supervise staff. Uh, that's really popular with many businesses, from small companies to big companies, and it, it, it enables individuals to get the transferable skills, which will help help the company they're with. But if they move on to another company, or for whatever reason. Uh, positive or negatively, they've got a better skill base with which to get a better job. So we, we do encourage an awful lot of that. And one of the important things about that is that it, it's not just going away and doing a training course with a provider. It's going away with other businesses 
So you can learn from as much from other businesses as you can. I think Linda mentioned that earlier, that collaboration amongst businesses and you can have a, the same challenge about a, a staff issue or a, a productivity issue but in a different sector and you can learn from, that, from somebody else who's just gone through that. Businesses are engaging enough with FE and HE for, the, for their in-work training? No. no. I think if we're all honest, no, and I think there's a whole bunch of kind of barriers that are probably in there. You know, partly Gordon mentioned that in the time scale that they can engage, you know, colleges have, and universities have got a huge provision that they've got to make. So I think it is about having the right model that's both a win-win for the educational establishments who've got a whole set of needs and the businesses have got a whole set of needs and it's finding a, a way, way to do that. I think it's also just about in today's world and uh, digital technology is what type of courses, what type of skills do companies need, what type of courses, what type of way does that individual who's going to learn it is going to need to find that and also just a bit thinking about much more the role of short courses and I think other economies do a bit of that particularly in coding we've seen the success of that those short courses in coding in Scotland and about those people who retrained how quickly they get into higher value jobs in, in in the labour market because we've got a demand and I think it's just about how we scale up some of those things quicker but also how do we make that awareness of that much higher and and how do we make sure that the kind of financial challenges that there might be for the individual that they're going to be able to overcome that so there's quite a lot in there that i think um we, we're already looking at as part of that kind of alignment piece but we need to think about the role of the private sector in that much more that one. <coughs> uh, best, best i can giving businesses the confidence to invest in the skills of their own workforce is, is a, a hurdle, if you like. Uh, it, it involves risk and, and money. So in addition to the work that we're doing, with, as Gordon uh, described, with the college sector to help colleges build a more a nuanced relationship with businesses in order to do bespoke uh, training and the like, we're also we've been supporting for quite some time mechanisms by which businesses can look at what it might mean to bring a much higher skilled employee into their workforce through, for example, knowledge transfer partnership and to see whether that is something that is transformative for them. And in the majority of cases, it turns out to be enormously transformative to bring a graduate in for a fixed period of time, subsidised by uh, UK and Scottish governments, to carry out a project, change something. Those graduates, those uh, um, highly skilled workers tend to to then be employed immediately, and that changes the business attitude to the skill level that it needs. So there are many ways in which we can help businesses with that, and we should be coming at it from a variety of angles. And oh, last one, last point, yeah. Yeah, just a mention of the other uh, aspect of things of our graduates not having business skills when they're in creative industries, particularly, which is uh, something I mentioned to Nora. I'm interested in your thoughts on that. Whoever wants to answer. And I think it's something that we need to be doing a piece of work with Creative Scotland just now around the screen screen unit uh, and the, the the sector itself. I would call it to non traditional employment, and people need to have the skills to be able to adapt. Whether it's a portfolio of work, whether they're bidding for work, but we need to do more in that space to make them more commercial, uh, both in terms of their approach, but understanding the value that they, they add and where their their kind of market prices in that, in that area, but I think it's something that we've, we've recognised. Uh, we've got the Creative Industries Skill Investment Plan and there, there are aspects of, of that portfolio type working in there that we need to do more on. Okay, uh, thanks so much. And so we move on to our final section and waiting very patiently to ask her question is Kezia Dugdale. Thank you, Convener. David, earlier you said that we often invest in social enterprises for their social impact rather than their financial impact. And in the first session this morning, we heard from Nora Senior who told us that very often social enterprises fall between the gaps because they don't neatly fit funding models. I wonder if the panel could share with us just exactly and specifically what you're doing to support social enterprises and how you can continue to see them as businesses with growth potential rather than just organisations that do social good. So, as I said, we, we can't manage over 100 social enterprises across the region often uh, doing great things, whether that's getting young people into into employment opportunities or providing social care in one way, one way or another, uh, often arts activities as well for uh, people with uh, physical and mental disabilities. So it's uh, absolutely fundamental to what we do. Where we are often focusing a lot of our support is to enable social enterprises to own assets and use those assets, whether that's a community asset transfer from a public sector body or whether it's a just development of something they, they need to do that. So once they've invested in that asset, they've got it to use in, to create act, uh, 
activities going forward. This your area? Yes, indeed. Yes. Um, I should say there is quite a broad spectrum of, of support available for social enterprises. As you'll be aware, the eco ecosystem of support is quite diverse. Um, in terms of Scottish enterprise, we're part of that. So we're not trying to play a part that is somebody else's part. We're playing to part, trying to play the appropriate role, which is to help those social enterprises that have ambition for scale to access our account management support and more widely to make available our specialist support to those businesses that would benefit from it. For example, we've um, been running some cohort programs for social enterprises um, focused on innovation, helping social enterprises become more innovative and then providing one-to-one -one specialist support for those that wish to then embed innovation within their businesses. Um, we've also promoting collaboration between social enterprises. There's a, a new initiative called Partnership for Procurement, um, for which Cooperative Development Scotland is a partner. And we're working to help businesses, social enterprises collaborate in bidding for public and private sector tenders. So some very specialist support orientated at that need. Thank you. I mean, if I can just come back to this idea that social enterprises should be considered as businesses, or at least some examples of them should be. So um, I'll give you one. Project 42, a social enterprise I visited in Edinburgh in Leith um, last Monday. They're a gym. They operate like a pure gym type model. They've got the potential to, to franchise. They've gone in, the, in their first eight months from employing one person to 24. They're just about to take on a piece of land worth £1.4 million. What they need is um, support for capital infrastructure and they need uh, help with access banking, much like any other uh, fast growing business would, but they can't get it because they're viewed as a social enterprise that does public good rather than a potential high growth business. So what can agencies do to support an organisation like Project 42? Starting point for them will be with Firstport as a high growth startup. So hopefully they're they're within their uh, yeah. Bid. Firstport did the visit. But they still need that access and, to capital. And then Social Investment Scotland, who is a specialist funding arm for social enterprises, as and there's a number of other organisations in that space as well. Um, how, if once they've pursued the journey through the specialist agencies, then clearly the mainstream and agencies are also a possibility. You see, all, also a possibility, but to them it doesn't feel like that because they, they don't feel like they're treated as businesses. The important aspect to this is a point that was made earlier in terms of the navigation of the support system, the ecosystem, and how we as different support organisations are working together to make that journey easy um, and transparent for the client. So I think that's the key point that we should take from your, your point there, is ensuring that they, they don't need to know every part of the support ecosystem. What they need to be is being supported in the round to meet their need. Okay. Okay, thank you. Well, I think we've given that a very thorough uh, look over quite a range of issues, so I would like to thank the panel, the witnesses, very much indeed uh, for your input. If oh, sir. Oh, sorry. I thought you were indicating to me that you wanted the minute to finish quickly. No, 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 no. I was indicating <laughs> that I would like to come in after Kezia dug yes, Clearly, sorry, the sorry, hand I, signals are not working I misunderstood today. your hand signals. I'm new to this. If, if uh, right, please carry time, on. Yes, please carry on. Thank you, convener. I'm, I am much obliged to you. Um, I wonder whether I could come back to issues I explored with Nora Senior and start with. Um, whether, you, whether you have a, a, an analysis of why Scotland's economy underperforms the rest of the UK, and whether you agree with the Fiscal Commission's projections for how our, our economy will perform in future. I'll start with Gordon McGuinness because he's looking at me. <laughs> that was a mistake. <laughs> Not at all. Uh, I, I just think since the big financial crash, then things have been sluggish, and we've seen, I'll, I'll make a point, uh, it's been said earlier, I'm not an economist, but, but particular areas have been sluggish and others have shown growth and we've went and, and things like oil and gas from real skill shortages to a slump in the, in the price of oil for a whole variety of, of reasons which has made that, that sector particularly uh, challenging. Uh, some of the issues we will face, I think, around Brexit that are going to make things better are actually going to exacerbate and make things uh, a lot worse and I think it's some of the unknowns that are in there particularly for businesses and how they how they react to that just now uh, we're working with an increasing number of companies that do have larger numbers of foreign uh, 
EU based foreign workers and starting to try and work through what the potential implications for for, for them are. So w working across the sectors and we kinda of touched on it earlier, some some go through really good times. If you look at food and drink, there's been, been really strong performance uh, and others then there's been, been ups and ups and downs on it. And I think as a, an organisation we can only respond as as best we can, working with industry leadership groups taking some soundings and taking some insights from them and then taking that into the kind of skills plan and what they were doing in, in conjunction with the Funding Council. I think in fairness though, Brexit's impact is likely to be across the UK. I don't think you were suggesting there was a differential impact in Scotland, or were you? We keep the answers fairly brief for this. We've, we have spent quite a lot of time on this session, uh, so... I think there's going to be challenges, I think, around some of the rural uh, regions when I look at the, the highlands and islands and the, uh, the number of people we do have, EU nationals working there, could have a disproportionate impact, I would think. To make, I think one of the things we've not really talked a lot about in this session is the, the attitude of companies to investment. I think many businesses would classify themselves as happy non-borrowers, so they maybe could get investment from the banks, but they're just a little bit nervous about going to take that step and I think more we, we do try and work with businesses to encourage them to do that um, and just a reflection on our, our latest business panel survey which we do every three or four months 70% uh, of the thousand businesses we surveyed had had good and steady performance over the last year and virtually the same number were optimistic about the next 12 months we don't forecast how they're going to do in 10 years time that would be a little bit optimistic but um, they, they are showing uh, it's, resilience and signs of optimism in the economy still. Ms. Hannah? Yes, convener, if I can just kind of add, and probably going to summarise some things that we've already previously said, but I think in terms of that kind of productivity level in Scotland and looking at the rest of the UK, business investment levels, I think particularly we, we do have challenges of that in Scotland. You know, the gap is massive in terms of what we need to do to make sure that we kind of um, hit the, certainly the OECD. That's partly R&D, it's partly capital, uh, but it's also just that risk, risk appetite. We've seen that particularly around the work we've been doing around manufacturing and the Manufacturing Action Plan, where we've been talking to very small companies about their appetite for investment, um, both in terms of the building, so the envelope that the company's in, and then the kit that's within it, and certainly the kind of management risk, you know, in terms of being able to go and, and borrow money, people are kind of happy not to do that. And then if they don't invest, we don't see the kind of productivity coming forward. And I think we are seeing some differences in Scotland and the UK around some of that, that a, a, a profile. Innovation levels, we've seen that going up in Scotland, but we need to see it go up even more, and I think that has been an issue around productivity. The management and leadership skills that we talked about. And trade and exporting, we know that there are some kind of challenges, but also just in terms of, um, in a period of uncertainty, um, people begin to think the best thing to do is hunker down. Actually, the best thing to do would be to look outward, to innovate, and to kind of start doing some different things. And without that ambition to do that, and some of that kind of appetite for risk, I think that has impacted on our productivity levels. And certainly the job for all of us is about how we encourage industry level, but individual companies, to be able to take those things forward. OK, any yeah. final, what, any of the other pa panel want to take part in it? Or you want to say something else? One final question, just a very quick one. If you were the minister, what changes would you make to your organisation? Right, one sentence each, maximum. Collaboration okay. amongst the agencies. Thank you. Greater agility. <laughs> and everybody <laughs> else is silent. Uh, uh, inclusive models. So inclusive models, right. In Dr Fancy, have you got a word? Couldn't go further than collaboration. It is exactly the right word. Okay. Final word, Ms. Hannah. Was that a sentence or a word? I, I allowed you a sentence, you, you, yes. I, you can do a sentence, you can do okay, a paragraph. I can do a whole paragraph. So, so I think it is about collaboration, but I think it's about really investing in the economy. I do think we're at the point, in terms of the strategic board, where we've got an opportunity collectively to be ambitious for Scotland and then make sure we really invest behind it. Our job then is to make sure we work together, but I think it's about collaboration and investment. Okay, well, thank you very much. And you've all given us very full answers, which we're appreciative of and will be very useful in our report. So thank you very much. And therefore, I draw this uh, session uh, to an end and suspend the meeting as we move into private session. Thank you.